I, I got to experience my first Catskill deluge, which I'd never had the, the, um, the experience Tell us about it. Yeah. Uh, well, I was heading from Phoenicia. I was planning to, to camp. There's a little site about eight tenths of a mile before you get to the Wittenberg base of Wittenberg there. Um, there's a campsite up to the left. Yep. And it started raining, I don't know, about an hour before I was there. And I was sweated right through. So I didn't even put my poncho on. And um, when I got to the site there, it was there was actually a big tent there. It was like a party going on or something. But everything was, was about four or five inches underwater. And um, I got in there and I... I just, I had no poncho. I couldn't set my rain up, my tent up in the rain. So I was literally just standing with my hands on my pole in the pouring rain. Wow. Um, and I said, you know, I can't, I, I can't do this. So I decided, made an executive decision and decided to head for the um, mountain terrace lean to. I said, I know I got a mile to the base. The bushwhacks were some of uh, the worst days I've ever had in the mountains, or life, really. Whereas Panther Mountain is totally opposite. It's a mountain on top of a crater. I think the weather challenges on this incident were particularly difficult. It is really the development of New York State. Catskills were responsible. Listening to Inside the Line, the Catskill Mountains Podcast. So we have Ted, like the five star reviews have been phenomenal in the past couple weeks. So I, I thank really? everybody yeah. for doing that. Yeah. That's awesome. This is the first I'm hearing of it. You don't share any of this with me. Well, you've got like to look it up. I, I'm like an outsider. Well, look it up yourself. I where do know, I find where where do I find this juicy info? Usually, Apple Apple Podcast is is when you you go and check out the five star review. Somebody said that they they're glad they got rid of Stump Stash. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm so signing off for the evening. Uh, I'll see you folks next year. Yeah. I'm so done. we'll well thank you all for the for the reviews. Really appreciate yeah. it. Even you know four to five stars is what's what's five stars is definitely what what we want but you know if you have time take a review on apple podcast or spotify podcast or, or whatever you can review it on but tonight welcome to episode 135 tonight we have tom walsh here to talk about his end-to-end -end long path through hike that he had and uh you know it's great to hear from tom because tom is the only one that has done it this north to south and south to north right uh, as far as I know, yep. Yeah. And Tom, Tom, I hate to, to, to ask this, but how old are you, sir? 66. 66 years old, and he has done a 372 mile hike in one, like, in one time. So it's, it's just, it's absolutely phenomenal. So Tom is here tonight. Tom, say hi to everybody. Hello. And he's good to be here. It's, it's, I can't wait to hear your stories. You know, Tom and I had a little, kind of a prenup for this and to hear some of the stuff he had to say was i'm just i'm I'm just ready to to hear it to finally hear it so let's uh get on with tonight so september 21st and 22nd catsco mountain search and rescue team is having a wilderness first aid and uh training class uh you can sign up online uh you know i had this pulled up so uh wow just all this crap that's sitting here so mm -hmm. um, members and aspirants of the 3500 club catsco mountain search and rescue team and the 3500 clubs is proudly present wilderness first aid training at the west hurley fire department on september 21st and 22nd priority will be given to the catsco 3500 hike leaders but there are other positions available secure your spot by registering for this course or obtaining more information at trail bomb project uh, Catskill 3500 WFAL. I'll post the link in there. Uh, in addition to this, Wilderness First Aid Training, CMSR is also offering a hybrid CPR course uh, at the same spot, the West Hurley Fire Department. Uh, this is open to all members and aspirants of the 3500 Club. Uh, definitely the priority is given to the hike leaders. Uh, if you're interested, once again, I will post the CPR uh, class. Uh, it's definitely important 
uh, to take a wilderness first aid just as just in case anything happens on the trail and you are prepared for uh, that instance that could happen. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, and we'll we'll definitely check it out if you can have the, the time. Go to this wilderness first aid training. It'll be very yeah. very be very fun. So just a a couple questions, Stosh. First of all, I'll note that the West Hurley Fire Department is on the eastern end of the Ashokan Reservoir, right on Route 28. So if you're wondering where that is, pretty accessible from the throughway. Um, you indicated it's open to everyone, but preference to uh, hike leaders for the 3500 Club. What was the cost of this? Good. Oh, it's a lot. good question. I, I yeah. so we can look that up and fill folks in next episode. Yes, I will definitely. I, I will find that out right now, okay. and uh, I can actually message them. But yeah, so I mean, sign up uh and check it out because it's it's definitely a, an awesome uh That's knowledge to know in the yeah in the back country you know you, ne you never know what you might run into with your mm -hmm. just yourself another hiker or just somebody on the trail that needs some help yeah so and just one final thing that i would personally like to know they'll they'll probably cover fractures abrasions cardiac arrest but do they cover um caring for somebody who's been attacked by a mountain lion will that be one of the segments i think that might you know tom has been involved in that with doing the long path so he might have to be involved with getting attacked mm -hmm. by a mountain lion damn mountain lions i know they're all over the place right tom yeah, yeah how to, maybe like how to put a tourniquet on your leg if the mountain lion tries to rip off your leg that would be useful information for hikers to have correct so, yeah correct all right yeah i might i might attend yeah i mean i probably will be there as well as a search and catskill mountain search and rescue team well so i might not attend well i mean just the last joking. time you, i'm just joking the I, last I, time I, you attended did I, I i saved jake's life a little bit but not yeah. not i mean not yours you were standing by just watching us with coffee what the hell was that that's, that's how i work <laughs> it was crazy so once again i would like to thank uh number one the supporters of the show number two the uh sponsors of the show and the hard cider donors of the show uh inside the line the catskill mountains podcast was able to do donate 750 dollars to local organizations recently uh 500 were donated to the catskill center and 250 dollars to the friends of the fettered and furry uh that was all behalf of you guys once again i don't pocket this money i don't want to i do this for fun i do this for my love of the catskills and uh thank you all for once again donating to the show and i i just i really appreciate it and this all goes to back to the catskills i don't want to see this go to waste i i don't i don't really need the money the catskills need some money to keep with the upkeep of the trails of the blowdowns especially once again we'll be getting into this right at this instant tropical storm debbie what a crazy instance this happened i mean this wasn't as bad as irene but you know we've had some flooding blowdown all over the place yeah i, I don't think it came close to what the catskills suffered um during and after irene but i'll say from my hike this past weekend there was water flowing everywhere yeah definitely I and I, yeah i didn't run into a lot of blowdown though yeah i'll have to say that too i i will piggyback on that that i didn't run down to the blowdown when i went hiking as well uh but i've heard other reports that you know slide mountain had a lot of blowdown uh different areas fox hollow had a bunch of blowdown it's just really the patterns were mm -hmm. so crazy of where the blowdown was so it's just uh you know we had some flooding up here in uh the oxego county area uh especially you know my house got a little bit of flooding in the basement it was fun trying to uh this was my first time with the basement ever getting flooded so we were just like what the hell do we do uh and luckily jessica never listens to this podcast she was freaking out before i came in and she had a cup that was she was pouring into a bucket from the flooding and i was like what the hell are you doing and she's just like this is the only thing i could come up with i'm like just let it do its course and we'll happen like we'll, we'll have to deal with it 
Yeah, have a chop pump? No, we don't. We don't need it. Yeah. We never need it. This yeah. is the first time. Mm -hmm. every, just about every everybody in, in the Hudson Valley that has a house built before, say, 95 has a sump pump in their basement. Very common. Yeah, I didn't have to deal with that. Tom, did you have any uh did you have any deals with this uh hurricane tropical storm, Debbie? Uh not particularly at the house here, no, but uh some of the trails I check around here, yeah, I had some blowdowns um up in Riddell State Park and uh yesterday I was over in uh, section twenty eight of the Long Path um doing some maintenance and I had a couple of good blowdowns in there too. Um, mostly just limbs and things though, you know, um, just loose and falling, and, but it wasn't too bad. Water is everywhere. Like you said, though, definitely. Yeah. And that's not too bad. Luckily we can carry those, uh, those portable saws that we have and cut those in a matter of minutes compared to bringing those massive chainsaws that would, that you might need for that, that area. So Tom, Jesus Christ, when the hell are you not doing trail maintenance? <laughs> well, I, I wasn't doing it for five weeks. I can tell you that much for 37 days while I was hiking the long <laughs> path. Um, but uh, I, I'm out there pretty often. I, I do maintenance for a number of um, organizations up here and with the long path and the trail conference. So um, between everything, it keeps me pretty busy. But one thing I did want to say about the maintenance is it's not as time consuming as people think it is it's something that once you have a trail that's in decent shape you you only got to go back once a month or something and take a look at it you know unless there's a storm like like we just had but it's um uh, i think a lot of people are are scared off of trail maintenance because they feel it's going to be a lot of work and it's really not it's really not once your trail is, is was is established it's just a matter of really keeping an eye on things so for yeah. me it's it's uh, I'll take pretty much I could probably do four to five days a month and cover everything that I do, which is Otsego uh, Land Trust, um, Otsego Conservation, DEC and the Trail Conference. Guys is freaking like iconic right here. Impressive. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just like and, and you know, you're you're right. You have to check on it with uh, Tom with our New York Detroit Trail Conference. We have to like it's twice a year, right? Fall and spring. I, mean, I, I think there probably is some sort of thing, but that would make sense. And it, like I said, if you get out there in the spring or if you get a new section of trail and you get some help, once it's cleaned up, there's not a lot to it. Um, there yeah. really isn't. You know, I got involved when the the club up here asked me to keep an eye on a trail is essentially what they said. Could you keep an eye on this section and just let us know? If anything comes, you know, falls down or anything. And then that evolved into, yeah, something fell down. All right. Well, can you take care of it for us? You know, and, <laughs> and I started doing that. And um, then I got a little for little yeah. bigger pieces and bigger pieces. And uh, like I said, it, it, it's really not a lot of work. I mean, it can get you can get backed up with it sometimes. And it feels like it's it's getting to be a lot. But I enjoy it. I, I love being out in the woods. So I might as well, you know, most days when I do maintenance, it, I make a day. I bring my lunch with me um, and I'll, I'll be in the woods anywhere from five to seven hours on, when I go in to do maintenance. And that's simple places of Oxego County of where the elevation gain is not that crazy. And, and that's, I said, uh, that's simple places like Oxego County where the elevation isn't as crazy as the Catskills and stuff. Oh, that's definitely a big difference with maintenance. Yeah. You know, if I had my way, I'd do all my maintenance on, on rail trails. Yeah. <laughs> we, and we have like up Oxego County way, we have more of, of grass and, and massive like uh goldenrod and stuff like that growing blackberries and stuff like that. It's a, it's a pain in the ass. We heard two weeks ago, the, the guests tell us that there's one guy that does like 10 miles of mowing with the push with the, you know, a push mower. Um, that's oh, how that he does Steve. his trail maintenance. Yeah. I think yep. Steve was yeah. about that. Yeah, you you went through there, so it's it's one of those sections in the long path. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The northern sections up where I am, uh, what they call the you know we call the northern twenty nine to thirty five. Um, we have the Long Path North Hiking Club that tries the best we can to maintain and keep those those trails in good shape but it's 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 a tough job you know there's not many of us in the club and most of us are my age or older um unfortunately it seems that 
it's not until you retire that you can really have the time to do these things, you know. And um, so most people that are into this stuff are are, are older. And uh, that's why we just try and give small sections. Hey, here's a half a mile, even a quarter mile section, you know. And, and like I said, once you get that and you're comfortable, then maybe we'll give you a little more and, and add on to it. But it, it's rough up here. Um, it's more of the, the long path than a trail. I like to say going through the Catskills when we're running on everybody else's trails, blue and red, and those are trails. You know, those are side by side walking trails. A lot of them up here, it's a lot of single track. Um, you know, where's the next blaze type of stuff? You know, um, yeah. I actually got lost in my own section when I did my through hike. You know, Tom, you don't have to admit that. <laughs> well, I know, but I just—it's too late now. Um, <laughs> But it was, they've, they've been in there doing logging. Um, we're supposed to do a reroute up in there. So there's been some neglect and they did some logging and things and there's overgrowth that I came upon a field of nettles that was massive and, uh, it just threw everything out of whack for me. So, um, like I said, it can get daunting sometimes, but most of the time I, I, I like it. I think it's fun. Yeah. And, you know, the northern part, uh, of course has more growth than than the, the southern part we have more growth of more grass like i said golden rods just prickers stuff like that so it's tougher to man, maintain but you get that sense of pride uh that sense of accomplishment when you do it you're just like damn i just did this i'm going to make somebody else's life a little bit better experience somewhat that's that's one of the issues with the northern section is um we don't have a lot of traffic um, which is why the trails need a lot of maintenance because they don't get hiked like they do in the Catskills. Um, yeah. And it makes it hard to get motivated. Um, like when I do trails in Otsego County up here for the land trust, I can clean up a trail. And I know this weekend there's going to be 30 or 40 people using that trail where I could do a section 28 up here and I can clean it up. And there might be, not be anybody who walked that section for three or four weeks. Um <laughs> Right. And, and that you know that's the, just the way it is. For some reason, once you get north of uh, Wyndham, once you get north of section uh, Route Twenty Three, um, it just it just it's a whole new world up here. It's it's yeah. a completely different world. Um, you can hike for two to three days, not see anybody. Um, so if, you, if people are looking for those type of solitude type of hikes on the long path, I recommend coming up north because it's uh there's some good climbs there's some beautiful walks and it's, it's it's i mean if you like solitude i'm a solo hiker um i think it's great yeah, yeah. I, I was up in that section north of uh, 23 a few weeks ago i did 14 miles up there and i saw one fellow the whole day uh there was a lot of sections of the trail that I, i'm going to say overall it was well maintained but there were a couple sections that you could tell that um the lack of foot traffic was uh, letting the trail get you know overgrown sort of but you know I, I was able to make my way along it's really lovely up there it's a totally different vibe than being down in the, the um the higher mountain area of the Catskills and I certainly encourage everyone to at least once a year if not once a season take your head out of the the higher peaks and and see the western cats and the the northern cats because it's uh it's a unique area to go hiking in yeah definitely agree agree and we'll hear more about that with tom later so uh i wanted to bring up something that i got the other day about uh new york state announces uh, a change to hunting and trapping and trapping licenses i know this stuff doesn't really have to do with the long path but it somewhat does because there's a lot of hunting involved and and uh, uh such during the winter seasons and uh you know i thought this was to bring up some good amount of people that i know that that hike are, are are hunters and such so uh new york state is changing how hunters and trappers can access and print licenses as they kick off the 24 to 25 season for the first time all hunting fishing and trapping licenses and tags are now printed on paper instead of plastic stop and uh, New York DEC Conservation said they will make the change more accessible to people. And it's uh, the ability for people to receive their license electronically and print tags at home will make it quicker and easier to get outdoors and connect with nature through hunting and fishing. And, you know, this is actually fantastic being someone, you know, I've worked at Walmart for 21 years and sometimes 
you know those areas go like down from the amount of people coming in that we have too much traffic and our computers will go down or something will go wrong with the dec area uh that it will take down just the the overall uh program that you use to get people with fishing and hunting and it's mostly hunting area and this is fantastic uh, of course and uh, as as a, a person that doesn't hunt and uh, doesn't trap uh i i don't really i just don't i just don't have the desire to do it but uh, i believe in and hunting and, and fishing it's, it's the way it's been ever since the native americans have been here probably ex ever since the existence of human beings and you know i think this is absolutely fantastic we need these deer populations to freaking cut down because i've never hit a deer but i'm sick and tired of my mom and dad hitting a deer i don't know well, is that just me yeah, yeah well it's it, it's kind of a crowd stopper when you say you've never hit a deer um that's i, I find that amazing man knock I can't on wood, say knock yeah, on I, can't wood. Say, I can't say the same for myself i've had a few deer hits um and sorry about it but some people will say that one of the most uh humane ways of eating meat is if you're a hunter um because the animal's not living in captivity it's living in the wild and you know uh presumably you're you're if you're a good shot you take it out in one shot so there's no, nothing wrong with hunting in a, a lawful and humane way from my yeah. point of view what do you think of that tom uh i'm the same i got the same attitude i'm not a hunter either um i don't eat venison per se or, or or wild meats like that if i did and i liked venison i don't know maybe i would go hunting you know yeah. but i hold uh no animosity at all towards people who do hunt uh, like you said they got we got to keep the populations in check and uh and there's uh, some good good meat out there you know i mean like i said if i liked venison i might be a hunter i don't know but i just yeah. never really liked it so never really got into hunting the one thing i've noticed about people in general who eat venison is it seems that they go through a lot of work and effort to prepare the meat for cooking and eating which yeah. re really makes you question how palatable it is on the one hand on the other hand i'm just not a big fan of meat eating and i i rarely eat meat so it, well i imagine know. seasoned and cooked properly most game meat is really really good you know yeah, correct, um, yeah. that's true and, and hunters are like hikers they're a breed of their own you know mm -hmm. they have their way of doing things and 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 uh like you said it takes a lot of work but that's part of the thing that's part of what it's about is the work you know yeah, yeah. and it's the thrill of of the hunt and stuff like that you know that's thrill of being old school that's true I've, I've run into some really cool hunters uh bushwhacking up in the catskills and good and, for them that's that's yeah. that, that's that's incredible stuff of them bushwhacking to get to their spot you know that they've been mm -hmm. for you know the passed on from family traditions and stuff sure. like that yeah they, and they know those areas inside and out so whenever you can talk to somebody who's a hunter up there because they really know those woods but like the back of their hand especially the plane garages that's something i've gotten a whole a lot of people that have been oh really involved. yeah yeah well. that that stopple point area was pointed out to me from a, a a local hiker that is just uh that is hunted up there and he stumbled upon it one day i'm like what the f that's yeah, yeah it's crazy not surprising and, but a lot of those hunters haven't seen mountain lions yet yeah well <laughs> not that they're telling you because that that's absolutely a prize trophy i would think for a hunter is you know to go after that type of game right right so, so, so i know you want to so you i know you want to move on but when you mention uh hunting and plane wrecks somehow i want to know when you're hunting down these plane wrecks how often do you find a porcupine I have yeah. never come across really? the porcupine at any time during my hikes in the Catskills. Wow. Huh. I can't never. Say this. I have I've calculated that I have done over three thousand miles of hiking in the Catskills. And not a single porcupine and not a single deer head. No, no, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh no shit. Good point. And not a single mountain lion carcass. <laughs> that you're telling us about 
not my print, let alone a carcass. Yeah. Well, so. are you willing to are you willing to give us a sworn statement to that effect that you haven't come across any mountain lion ca uh, carcasses while hiking in the Catskills? One hundred percent. No mountain lion yeah. feces as well. Uh, there was that one deer carcass up in the tree we saw, though. Remember? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, right. It's you know sometimes I'm th that was uh that was really weird. That was on uh, North Mountain. That was really weird. Um, What'd you guys see again? Uh, Tom, did I? I was, I, just, make, I was just making a joke. No, oh, okay. no, it's right. happened. <laughs> it's I know it's happened before that somebody posted that on. Uh, now that on you mentioned it, I remember now. Yes, it's a trail conditions plate. I'm pretty sure it was like a Southwest Hunter or something like that. I think they skinned it and hmm. took the meat out from it and then hung it from a, a tree up on Southwest Hunter. I don't understand why i do that you know i've seen i've seen weird what animal is this the deer, the deer. yeah the they deer. probably they probably hung it from the tree to to dress it while it was hanging from the tree that's pretty common yeah trust me I, I grew up i grew up further upstate than you and within probably a a 10 mile radius of my house there everyone hunted but my family so i knew i knew all about hunting and their practices and and going after deer and skinning and dressing deer and all that stuff so they typically hang them from a, a tree and, and dress them yeah well they're up in the air that's less weight i mean i understand yeah yeah you know and well and that goes back to what i said before some people you know are of the belief that you need to do that right away because it enhances the flavor of the meat so yeah I have no clue about yeah. that. I, I, well, I'm not going to do a deep dive into what some of my friends do when it comes to hunting and dressing their deer, but man, it's they they go through like some almost ritualistic practices. Hook us up to, on the show, man. Yeah, maybe, maybe if you guys, you know, if we want to promote that. It's life. It's you know, yeah. brings back to the Native American days. Come on. All right. So as we move on, we talk about you know tropical storm Debbie climate change somewhat uh i've recently come across this this article that said the average temperature of 121.9 degrees leads to the hottest month in death valley history so death valley national park experienced its hottest month on record in july of 2024 with a 24 hour average of 108.5 degrees that beats the 2018 record of 108.1 degrees it's only 0.4 degrees but still the average high throughout the july was 101 121.9 degrees with nine days above 125 degrees uh, this is the crazy stuff about this uh there were several deadly or life-threatening heat-related incidents on the california park including a death of a motorcyclist riding in extreme temperatures and a man who experienced second degree burns on his feet after losing his flip-flops scorching hot sands dude this sounds like something that happens at freaking catterskill high peak or uh catterskill falls sorry this sounds like something that happens at catterskill falls when somebody falls over the observation area we talk about later um so six of the 10 hottest summers have come within the past 10 years which should serve as a wake-up call which uh superintendent mike reynolds said record breathing months lead uh to this uh once in a lifetime experience as the norm as we can see continue to see global temperatures rise visitors rise to the park our visitors come to the park and should plan ahead and prepared for to face extreme temperatures during the summer months now this is what says from death valley and this is the greatest thing uh, i just found this to be absolutely insane visitors to death valley during the summer are urged to stay within a 10 minute walk of an air-conditioned vehicle drink plenty of water eat salty snacks wear a hat and use sunscreen 10 minute walk of an air-conditioned vehicle absolutely insane and, and what do you do when your car breaks down uh you're out you're out there in you know death valley you you can <laughs> rent you can rent a jeep i mean you know going in and around death valley valley is quite an experience and there's a, a number of 
I'm going to call them primitive or unmaintained roads that people go out on. And you'll get into these stories where people will rent a, a Jeep and think because they have a Jeep, they can drive just about anywhere. So they're driving wherever they want to in Death Valley and it breaks down on them. What do you do? Right. Her yeah. car's not air conditioned anymore. So my, my daughter has spent a lot of time in Death Valley and she'll go, she'll tell you the preparations that you know, go into taking a, a trip out into Death Valley with like bringing a tarp and poles. Um, so you can stay outside of your car under the tarp if you have to, putting balloons on your car. If, if you have to be rescued, you're supposed to have a bunch of balloons that you can blow up. Um, wow put outside of your car so they can see it more there's you know it's a very fascinating place death valley i hope to get there sometime myself tom have you ever been there death valley no i have not um maybe that'll be up put on my bucket list for next summer yeah but, um, well I'm don't go in the summer then. this is what we're hearing don't go in july You'll <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, right. all right next winter yeah yeah uh, i'm not a big fan of heat so yeah, the their winters are a little bit better, and I would ex I expect that their their winters are a little less people in the, the summer. So I think it would be pretty phenomenal time to go there. Uh, and just I just ten minute walk of an air conditioned vehicle, you know, that's just absolutely insane. And you know, we have I I, I with these humidity, we have heat indexes of like a hundred and one to like a hundred and five, but you know, I lived out in Arizona for two years and we had probably, you know, the highs were like 115, but they never went into up like 129 to that kind of crazy. And it felt, it felt hot. The sun was beating, but it didn't feel like crazy. Like up in New York, when, when it's a hundred, you know, it's, it's like 90 degrees, but it's a humidity is hundred percent. It's insane. You feel like death. You walk out to your car and you feel like, holy shit, this killed me. But I I can't ex I can't ex say the I can't talk about the 129 degrees of of desert heat. But you're right, Tad, and uh, you know, we right, Tom. That's kind of like a, a Death Valley. I've heard is a whole nother experience, just in its own. The West is a whole nother experience in its own. Yeah, yeah, completely different. Yeah. Uh, but you can't see the greenery, you know, hiking recently. I just, uh, I can't, the lush greenery, it just blows my mind every time. Yeah. It's, you know, we're, we're kind of at that peak time of year now, peak greenage, I guess we could say. And then we're a little more than a month away from the fall, right? The, right. the, the, the big, you know, colorful show before winter sets in, it's a great time of year. Yeah. What freaking nettles are at peak, ferns are at peak. <laughs> don't don't even mention don't even Tom. don't even mention nettles around <laughs> me, man. My God. Tom's like, crying Tom. right now. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a massive nettle field in my section. I have to decide whether I'm gonna deal with it or just let it sit till it dies. Yeah. Best best thing to do, Tom, is you go out there with one of those five gallon spray cans when nobody's looking, you pump it up, you go out there with it, just spray the whole field. Just spray them. <laughs> It's not and a they'll crime. grow back next year, though. That's the yeah. thing. They don't give a shit yeah. about you. They'll grow no. right back. You're crazy. So last last uh, thing on shooting the shit. Uh, hiker, uh, Tad, we're going to skip over the Olympics. The Olympics are boring. Ooh, that's okay. That's yeah. all right. So uh, hiker trapped in, in Slot Canyon for 13 hours in Arizona. So... Uh, Two people were rescued from northern Arizona Canyon on July 19th after the camp it stuck for 300 feet deep in the canyon while hiking, according to Coxonino County uh, Sheriff's Office. Now, I've been there, uh, hiked there a little bit when I lived down in Arizona. So Madison Hart said the rescue team got to me about 13 hours. My legs uh, had turned purple from standing for so long in the same area. Hart and her friend were hiking on July 19th at Wild cat tank canyon just located north of page arizona which is the uh, uh famous for uh god damn i'm trying to remember those slot canyons that everybody goes to that pays pays a lot of money to uh I, it'll it'll come back to me 
Two climb down to a lower area of the canyon, both of them getting stuck in between narrow rock walls. Uh, she was stuck for her hips, unable to sit or lie down, uh, go forward and backward. This this reminds me of the, the movie 127 Hours. And uh, she said her heart and her friend tried lighting a small fire to send a smoke signal, screaming for help over 10 calls uh, to 911. And luckily, one of them connected and uh, they, d they got through to uh, rescue uh personnel and uh heart's friend was rescued five hours earlier than her due to heart being being unable to move in the position and the rescue team leaving her to stay in the canyon until dark and there was video i'll have to post this video of them getting rescued with a helicopter actually coming down in the area uh she said that she's glad that her friend are alive and so thankful for every person who helped us they saved our lives and we'll never forget that uh coso nino county sheriff's office did not immediately respond to the a request for information so after seeing this uh she only posted about 10 seconds of where she was and the air the helicopter flying over but i've been in the slot canyons out west of in arizona and utah and there have been some times of where not say that i would be caught in the area but i kind of thought about it and I was just like, damn, this is a, a little sketchy situation of where you'd have to take your pack off and kind of chisel your way through the area. And uh, I, I, I don't know. That's a little scary. Luckily, I have my my wife who has uh, is little anxiety and she would never let me go through these areas with her <laughs> with her. What do you think, Tad? Yeah, slot canyons. Um we have them in the Catskills. I don't think they call them slot canyons, though, but we have those, you know, narrow passages. You'll find them from place to place. Uh, I don't think I'm, you know, I'll say in the gunks, though, I, I have climbed up some of those to get up and over the ridge. Um, they're not. Those, no, aren't, they're not, those aren't curvy, though. Those are freaking jagged. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, you know, and then they got a lot of like talus rock in them that you have to climb over. It's an interesting experience. Um, it's fun to do, particularly when there's some level of ice and snow in there because you can get better traction as you're going through. Um, yeah, but the sure. slot canyons, it must be a unique experience until the water comes along. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, 13 hours, though. That's absolutely insane. You know, I've, yeah done about four slot canyons in utah and arizona that i could say noticing when i did what they call the buckskin gulch the longest deepest slot canyon in the world i only did about seven miles of it and seeing uh debris 50 feet above your head really yeah. kind of raises your concern of holy shit that debris got up there by water mm -hmm. and what happens like you know you you gotta keep a keen eye just a i can't even just thinking about that of what imagined you know a lot of people don't realize that you know 50 to 100 miles north of you could be a rainstorm and that all flows into that slot canyon and 10 hours later that slot canyon could be filled with the water that was from that rainstorm crazy what about you tom you ever get out west do any hiking slot canyons uh, unfortunately no i i did live in colorado for a little while when i was a younger man but i wasn't very much into the hiking unfortunately when i had the rocky mountains in my backyard mm. um so no but again they they're on my list for things i'd like to do you know in the future i, I would like to actually grab a motor home for a month or two and and just go around and see a lot of things you know yeah. a nice trip is kind of like what i'm what i'm planning towards yeah i have a, a good friend of mine's son just um he's uh graduated college has a master's degree quit his job he built a camper to go on the back of his pickup truck and tomorrow he and his girlfriend are leaving for an indefinite duration um but cross country or wherever in the country north america their travels take them but they're going out to explore and I, I really encourage young young people to get out there and do it don't wait until you're my and tom 
ages to to take time off and do those things try to make time for it when you're young well it get, it gets harder to do um, those type of things, because when I was a younger man, that's what I was thinking, you know, yeah. oh, when I retire, I'll get a motor home and hit the road for like two years or something, you know, but, but now you have all these, you know, my family's here, my grandkids and everything, you know, yeah. and like my wife says, there's no way I'm not seeing my grandkids for two years. You know what I'm saying? So it kind of changes. That's why I said, now we're looking at maybe a month at a time or, you know, uh, 30 days at a time mm -hmm. and try and do something like that. But, uh, there's too many ties now. I got there's too much in your life to just pick up and go, you know, and even five weeks. Yeah. Do it when you're younger. I, I told a friend of mine two summers ago, um, and he took my advice. He's, he's a little bit older than you, Tom has two grandchildren. They were at the time ages eight and 10. And I told him, you need to take your grandkids now cross country for the summer. Cause when they're a little older, they're not going to want to do it with you you know, when they have their social groups. So he did it. They took two months off. They rented an RV. They went cross country with their grandkids. Yeah, it was, nice. They had a fabulous time. Wow. I've got seven grandkids, six, seven Ooh. on the way. So wow. I don't know if I can Yikes. get them all in the RV. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. You better, stick, you better stick to trail maintenance, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, sounds well, like it's where your sanity is. Through. Yeah. No. Nice. Are you with diaper changes? <laughs> yeah. Five seconds flat. Yeah. Done. I thought we were talking about Olympics. <laughs> yeah, right. So, okay. uh, Tom and Tad, once again, thank you for shooting the shit. Really appreciate it, Tom. Thank you for joining in on this on this weird chat that we go all over the place with. So, uh, once again, thank you to the monthly supporters: Darren, Vicky, John, Betsy, Denise, Vanessa, Joseph, Jim C, and David and Chris. Thank you guys very much for supporting the show. Really appreciate it. Also, thank you uh, to the awesome sponsors of the show, Outdoor Chronicles Photography. Capture your love story against breathtaking backdrop with the Outdoor Chronicles Photography. Molly specializes in adventure couple photography, and she'll immortalize your moments amidst the stunning landscapes of Catskills, Adirondacks, and White Mountains. She'll craft timeless images that reflect your unique bond in nature's grandeur. Embark in the unforgettable photographic journey with Outdoor Chronicles Photography. Don't hesitate to get a hold of Molly on all platforms. I am stuttering like crazy because my goddamn dogs are in the background barking their faces off for no apparent reason. So just want to let everybody know that. Discover the wilderness through with Trailbound Project. Our expert-led hiking and backpacking education programs offer unparalleled outdoor experiences. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned adventurer, join us to learn essential skills, explore stunning trails, and connect with nature. Start your journey with Trailbound Project and unlock the wonders of the great outdoors. I will have their post. Once again, all these uh, the sponsors and such is, is posted in our show notes. So check them out. So, also, if you uh, mention the podcast or one of your hikes through social media, we'll chat about it on the show. So, mention us, tag us on Instagram, Facebook, or whatever. We'll mention you and talk about uh, you on the show. So, also, Overlook Outdoors is having a summer sale. Uh, check out their stuff online. They have great Catskill merchandise. Uh, use the code SUMMER2024 to check out their stuff and get a summer discount code on their beautiful Catskill merchandise. I actually have a quite a bit. I've ordered quite a bit from them and they keep uh, telling me not to order. And I don't know why, because they're absolutely, their stuff is absolutely phenomenal. So what are you guys drinking tonight, Tad? Well, I guess you, you're having me go first because you know, Tom will outdo me. Um, I'm, I'm having a delicious um, Coke on the rocks. Hey, that's different. Jesus, different yeah. coffee. Hey, woo, Whoa, different. yeah, it's like a rum and coke without the rum. Well, I'm not. I'm not out doing anybody. I just got a glass of water. Hey, that's okay. Got to stay hydrated. I am having a 1911 hard cider pineapple. So, I'm going to tag them in this, even though they won't care about it, because, uh, yeah, previous hikes. So. Tad, I'm going to let you go so I can go to the bathroom real quick. So, oh well, that with, uh, yeah, with, with, I, I like that you're going to you're you're going to step out of the room while I go over my hike. That's how that's how interested you are in in my hiking endeavors. Is it is are my hikes as All boring right. as what I drink? No, 
No. Okay. So, okay. I will this go is with so the, insulting. The, I've been so insulted here. It's going to take me a, a minute to regroup. So just hit the okay. pause button. I'm going to have to get my thoughts back together. Okay. Hike. You want me to do both of my recent hikes? Cause we didn't have a show last week or just hit we didn't. one of them. Uh, so let's go over with your first one and then we'll, we'll have Tom and then we'll go over with the second one. Okay. So two, two weeks ago as part of my trying to click off these, uh, segments I need to do for the Catskill all trails challenge. I, uh, had a small segment of the Sager trail to do and a segment of the Pine Hill West branch trail to do. So I, I parked at uh, lost cove cycled down to Burnham hollow road and bushwhacked over to uh an old what i'm gonna well the lower part was an old well not old maybe 30 years old 25 year old logging road that went up one of the ridge lines and then branched east into the coal and eventually turned into what i'll describe as an old ox road that went um up into the coal between um big indian and eagle and uh it was quite interesting i mean it was fascinating to me to see how that you know at least over 150 years ago how they improved leveled off this road um had dragged rocks to to build up the downhill side of the road so it was level with what was the uphill side of the road and then brought brought you right up into the call between again big indian and eagle so I, I continued i did that uh, section of uh the sager trail where the nettles mm. were vicious were just vicious okay i mean going up the ox trail there was really no nettles it was it was kind of splendid hiking not a lot of low ground cover and then once you pressed it over that and got onto the the mark trail just big vicious patches <laughs> of nettles i swear when you would walk by them they would growl at you and yeah once you i mean tom knows these types of nettles they're just ferocious um so and that that day was accompanied by the three h's of summer hiking which is humidity heat and more humidity okay <laughs> i mean the, right the the humidity index if there is such a thing was like in the three thousands okay oh, wow. it, it, yeah the rain had come through early that morning and I, I had a few showers as i was driving in but it was i mean everything was just dripping with moisture and uh it was a decent hike and i was uh overall 12 and a half miles 3850 feet of vertical gain over eagle haynes uh balsam and bel-air nice so the the views from from bel air they're i mean i've been up there once or twice they're i i think they're actually pretty decent they're worthwhile well when you say bell are you talking about the ski area or the yeah. mountain okay so the the mountain proper is east of the ski area oh it's, you're talking yeah, about it's, towards the lean-to yes oh shit! i yeah. haven't gone over there yeah it's you know it's one of these interesting mountain tops where it's just bedrock at the top no trees no ground cover just this not all that large but barren completely barren area where the trails converge um you know interesting place to hang out to camp zero view but you're also um right there at the edge of that huge segment of old growth forest that Mike Kudish writes about that that takes you all you know all the way into you know almost a gram wow yeah so and, and that's, that's really the high yeah that's I mean that ox road was very cool the nettles were not very cool but that whole segment of old growth forest was for me was really epic cool so I enjoyed it yeah. a lot. Old other than the, other stuff. than the three, yeah. Other than the three H's, which are what are they again, Tom? What are the three H's? Well, I, I just say humidity, humidity, and humidity. Uh, <laughs> the hell with the heat, right? Yeah, yeah right. Okay. It's all tied in the freaking one. Well, it should be 
humidity sweat humidity because you just burn off so much goddamn sweat during that time that you have to replenish yourself i doubt whether i mean we could get scientists i doubt if it's really sweat then it's so humid are you perspiring or is it just the air when it comes into contact with your body and your body is actually cooler than the ambient air mm. so is the is the humidity condensing on you i just don't know enough about the science of it to to have a definitive opinion but well, in um, my case it's sweat i can guarantee yeah right it's sweat yeah. what did you tom what have you done recently besides the long path that you did um what do you mean as far as hikes yeah you, i know you did some trail maintenance stuff right well yeah that that's just been a, I, I after the hike i pretty much didn't do anything for a couple of weeks and uh just last week i started getting out again i had to go pick up uh one of my stashes up at uh, elm ridge so uh that was my first hike after my true hike it was about three and a half miles just up to the lean to um because i put stashes for my true hike so i had to go retrieve my empty container up there um and then after that i I've, I've done maintenance yesterday i did nine miles and the day before i did nine and a half so i <laughs> think i'm st starting to get back into it a little bit and both of those days entail doing maintenance too so i feel like i'm starting to get back i, I realize how much i miss the woods when i got out there you know i, I start walking along and, and thinking wow this is why i forgot what's so great about it being in the woods you know and um so I'll be getting back in there a lot more in the next couple of weeks. That's for sure. Where were you? Where were you uh, doing your stuff? Well, I was doing a maintenance at. Uh, I did some over in Compton Bridge with the Land Trust. We uh, we got a massive knotweed problem over there. Japanese knotweed. Oh um, God! So, yes, Horrible shit. Yeah. Yeah, that took over the whole trail almost. So um, we did some work over there, and then, like I said, I, I was up to Riddell three times in the last week or so and then yesterday i ran over to section 28 took a quick look at that so uh, i'll probably spend the next couple of weeks just checking up on most of my maintenance areas fortunately over here in otsego i only have a couple with the state land because we don't have a lot of trails um, we have 21 yeah. state forests in this county and i think maybe three of them have actual trails um that are marked and we can't maintain trails unless they're blazed. So that puts us into a position where, like, you can go to a state forest run. I've got, within 10 minutes of my house, I get seven state forests. And I, I can literally walk to five of them. And wow. But none of them have, they have logging roads and old seasonal roads and things, but none of them have designated trails that we can go in and maintain. Yep. So that makes it that makes it a problem. I'm actually working with the DEC now. We're looking to put about three and a half, four miles of trails into Milford State Forest. Um, up nice. Two hundred five. Yeah, well, we're, we've got it walked out with the DEC. We've got it figured out. We're just waiting for their approval. And as soon as they say yeah, we'll put the blazes up and we'll assign some maintainers and we'll start cleaning things up. You know, that's phenomenal. You know, one once again, step in the right direction is what we want to do make these forests uh i mean most of them are only observed by hunters i would say up in the oxego county area old logging roads old ccc roads and stuff like that uh hunters like to come up here but i would love these areas to be accessible for hikers as well you know tom I, I'm, I'm with you on that when i've done the oxego octet i've done more than that and having these small forests is very essential for people just to to get out and have a good time right next to their house and and one of my one of my biggest things that i try to promote especially for folks my age um is that these these old ccc roads like you said and the seasonal roads are great hiking um, yeah. You can drive your car up into one of these state forests and just pull it off the road and get out and walk the roads. And and it's a great way to be in the woods without actually being in the woods. You know what I'm saying? You, you're not worried about stepping in water and wet holes and bugs and you're actually out walking along the roads. But it's, you know, it's, it's easier walking, but it still gives you the opportunity to get outdoors. Right. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of the CCC roads. I love walking on them. I truly do. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, not not everybody's capable of hiking the devil's path. So 
Like, no, but I, it's, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, as I get older, you know, my knees become more and more painful. And, uh, sadly there, there's going to come a day where I'm going to be a CCC trail hiker or road hiker, you know, but at least I'm still no getting disrespect. Out there. Yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, um, it's just having accessible opportunities to get outdoors for everyone. Exactly. And, and they're, like I said, where I live, they're 10 minutes away. Anybody in this county can get in their car and drive for less than 10 minutes and be in a state forest. Mm -hmm. And, and like I said, you just get out in the car and park it along the road and you can walk two, three miles on these roads, turn around and come back and you got a five mile hike under your belt. You know, yeah. it, uh, it, it's not difficult. There's, there's climbs, there's little hills and things, but like you said, there's certainly no devil's path type stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, uh, personally, I, I, I'm glad I did it this year because I don't know if I would have been able to do it next year. So I'm very glad I got it under my belt now and, and got mm -hmm. it over with. Yeah, and you know, a lot, a lot of stuff you can just find on I, I I for one search on Google Maps. If you zoom in and you see a green area, that's a state forest, and you have access yes. to that. Yeah, it's, they have a different, a different color. Yep. Yeah, you just need to kind of research after that, find out what the state forest name is, where the roads are, what is accessible, and you can explore that to your death. You know, it's it's absolutely phenomenal. That's what I did with the Oxigo challenge. You know, I went up to Charles E. Baker, which is towards Nor uh, Norwich of my area, and that it's just one of the biggest state forests uh, besides the Adirondacks. Actually, the Adirondacks is 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 bigger, but uh, Charles E. Baker is one of the biggest state forests. And you can just explore there. So it, it 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 does take a little bit of research, but. You could have a, an endless amount of opportunities with with just searching on Google Maps or just searching Google in 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 general of your local area. Well, did you know the with the Octet Challenge? I'm the only person that ever did a super ultra Octet Challenge, and that I did all twelve of the hikes in one day. Psycho. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Very well, they're short hikes. You know, they added up to about. <laughs> Ended up to about 20 miles by the time I was done and 150 miles of driving. But um, <laughs> that's that's one of the great things about Otsego Outdoors is these hikes and things. And it, I tell people all the time, if you're looking for hikes, go online. Like you said, yeah. just Google things and, and you'll find plenty of places to go hiking. Yeah. So, you know, you talk about this stuff previously, you know, Tad, with your, your awesome hike over in the Southern Catskills. Tom with your your hikes up in the Oxigo area. I recently took my friend John up to Becker Hollow. I don't I know Tad you've been up there but Tom have you ever done Becker Hollow? Um uh, not sure. Oh, I, no, I don't it, think I have. I don't think I have. It's a beast. So it's 2.2 miles to the top and it's around 2300 feet of elevation gain. So it's it's 1000 feet per mile. It's wow. a beast. And I, I, I've, I was ready for it. You know, my friend, John, I, I told him I, I, I was, I was kind of a, a dick at this time. And I told him it was only 4.2, 4.4 miles long. And he's like, oh, hell yeah, let's do that. I didn't tell him the elevation gain. <laughs> so we got the, the, the first thing I want to say is that we got down to the parking area. This was fantastic. So uh, Tad, I want to tell you that the Tesla is in repair right now for the trunk. And I got a freaking Alfa Romeo to to go with it. It's pretty weird. Oh, really? Wow. It what sucks. Happened to the, what happened to the trunk? A tree fall on it, or no? The your, trunk. Your wife, self... your wife throw you in into the back of your car. Oh, what, she doesn't know how there? to drive that thing. So the trunk self, you know, it's it's one of those powered uh, trunk mm -hmm. closing. It self closed on it sunk uh, on itself, and it like it was off alignment, and it hit the glass, and it cracked the glass. Uh. So. Tesla oh, is covering all this, which is a phenomenal. So I, I find that crazy after 77,000 miles. So this place that Tesla referred me to is gave me an Alfa Romeo. So I'm sitting in the parking lot with a, an expensive car. And I hate to say it like this. I, I don't mean to, to recool, but a, a, a bunch of a van of Jewish people came by and asked me about the hike. And they're just like, are you doing the, this hike? I'm like, yeah, this is Becker Hollow. I'm like, 
two miles and they're like two miles that sounds easy i'm just like two miles with 2200 feet of elevation gain and they're just like oh that doesn't sound bad i'm like it's actually horrible but <laughs> but it has an inflatable pool at the top and they're like what <laughs> and they're like i'm like the 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 the, the people that uh, that are up there the volunteers offer an inflatable pool so bring your your swimsuit up and they're just like oh yeah we'll do that and then they sped off they seriously like spun their tires and sped off i'm like i don't think i convinced them and 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 that's how you kept the dec busy this week from doing their <laughs> podcast is by giving out this misinformation so there was a dozen uh people that went up to hike becker hollow got to hunter mountain expecting <laughs> inflatable to dive pool. in the inflatable pool and they were gravely disappointed exactly so, and so this, they got a so but they got a helicopter ride back down to their car so that's not that bad they missed out on the inflatable pool but they got to ride in the dec helicopter right not bad not bad yeah so it you know to be honest it wasn't a bad hike it's it's a it's a beast i don't mind it uh it's pretty cool you're in the woods it's the whole a time. boring hike it's a boring it's, hike up it's that, a beast up that log it's a beast but it's also there's so many trails like that and there are roads like that in the catskills that I'll, i will say though it's a great hike in the winter yes like going going down that in the winter especially if nobody's been down ahead of you you can just fly down that when there's like a good snow base you got your snowshoes on it's almost like teleskiing with your snowshoes on i've done yeah. that that's fun and you can it, it's a good training hike if you want to do some awesome elevation gain per mile yeah. so i mean i he was he hated it number one we got to the yeah. top there was no view we had the clouds flying through on the way down we hit some rain and uh you know i i gotta say it wasn't a bad hike uh with no views i mean i enjoy the views all the time but the one cool thing is on the way back when we were traveling over back to hunter we we slowed down and there was a bear picking apples from a tree i didn't get a picture of it oh, yeah. uh, but it was beautiful just picking apples from a tree and then the the cub was kind of like reaching up for the mama to give it the the apples and i was just it was my friend has never seen a black bear in his life so it was great so you're so you were below two thousand feet when you saw that oh yeah the elevation was, yeah it was driving towards kind of like the dip going up okay all right so you're you were in you were in you were in the alpha romeo when you saw the bear yes yes okay. yes all right you know that one and, rich person's house that sits on the side of plateau yeah it's where my uncle Vinny's house is right there yeah, yeah. Vinny from uh yeah. from my cousin Vinny you know I remember yeah, him. that's him my uncle yep yeah that that's the road that they went up to and and it was the the, the bear was picking apples from there so it's uh -huh. absolutely phenomenal well, they like bears like those rich apples yeah so I just saw, I just saw unfortunately up in Old Forge they had to put bears down for that reason they were my daughter was just up there camping this past weekend and sent me photos of bears up in a tree eating apples right in town and then uh, my son-in-law's sister posted this morning that the DEC had to go unfortunately had to go in and euthanize the mother and two or three cubs um, yeah. because they, they were just right in the middle of town they were getting too used to what was going on and. Uh, that's, that's I heard about that. Sad, yeah, it's such a sad thing to hear, you know. Yeah, it's it's the people. I, I they're not like you know, you and me, Tom and Tad and me, that uh, respect the wildlife and will you know carry out what we're carrying. They'll just leave their shit outside when they're camping and stuff, and the bears will disintegrate it. And then unfortunately, this is the crap that happens. And I, you know what? let bears do their thing and freaking rip these mm -hmm. people apart we need we need a new plague anyway we're, we're yeah. seeing a whole new we're, we're seeing a whole new side of stosh tonight we right? are yeah <laughs> we, he's giving out he's giving out false information to people <laughs> of certain ethnic backgrounds he's he's like Suburb suburbanites should be you know drawn and quartered by <laughs> wild bears in the town center what's Listen, what's next tom these, you, bring out, you bring out the worst in stosh i know right <laughs> so i gotta admit he's these, intimidated he's intimidated by all of tom's volunteer work oh that's God. what it is and the beard and the beard and the yeah tom tom's sporting like that you know old 
old man, you know, hiker. John Burroughs beard. Yeah, yeah. John Burroughs would be envious of Tom. Definitely. Okay. I gotta admit, the um, these the, the the people that stopped by the, the this uh these Jewish people would have never done this hike. They would have gone up a a quarter of a mile and been like, hell no. I gotta admit. I've never that's, I, well that's that's what you think, but I'm gonna check the DEC weekly reports now <laughs> and, and see see what search and rescue operations there were on Becker Hollow this past week. All right. Yeah. And, and if and if there's part of the report is that two two adult males were seen fleeing in an Alpha Romeo <laughs> with rental plates. Then I think they're rental. I don't know. I gotta yeah. I don't know. But we're on to something here. We are. Next thing you're going to tell us about is how you guys got a ride share out of like downtown Hunter to get away from the area or something. That was Cairo. That was Cairo. So, uh, Ted, let's let's uh, skip the second part of our. Oh, you, oh you're going to skip the second. OK, you're going to skip the second. A, we're an hour and seven oh, minutes okay. and I want to get I know to Tom's yeah, stuff. OK, so you, I just I'm just going to throw out there. This is the the after I don't know how many thousands of miles I've hiked in the Catskills. But I'm I'm well over 500 times, you know, to the top of these high peaks in the Catskills, and this is the first time ever I went to Catterskill Falls. So but yes. we're going to skip it. We'll we're going to skip next. it because it's no, because it. Well, I'm going to do another epic hike this weekend, so I'm going to talk about that one. We're just going to we're going to pretend that my side hike to Catterskill High, this Catterskill Falls, never happened. It didn't happen. We will. Once again, Volunteer 3500 Club is having Trailhead Stewards, Catskill Trail Crew uh, need some help doing some trail maintenance around the area. Catskill Mountain Club Visitors Center, Jolly Rovers Trail Crew, uh, Bradley Mountain Fire Tower. Definitely check out for all volunteer opportunities, especially New York, New Jersey Trail Conference as well. Tom will be talking about that a little bit tonight. Uh, stickers, don't forget to email me or... Uh, any Facebook opportunities or stuff like that, uh, Instagram. Also, stop at Camp Catskill for some stickers. So, and, and weather, gear, and gear, and, and and awesome gear as well. So, the weather forecast for this weekend. Give me one second. So, it looks like uh, Friday we will have clear. And uh, a high of 63 and a low of 57, that's at night. So it looks like a beautiful time. But Saturday and Sunday looks like moderate rain showers both days, a low of 55, a high of 59. A little bit of rain, not too much. A little bit of wind here, 30, stuff like that. So uh, it seems like the heaviest rain will be on Sunday morning. Very mild uh, temperatures winds increasing late at night but nothing too crazy so bring your 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 weather gear stuff like that wind rain ponchos stuff like that just to keep yourself uh ex not ex uh, exposed to these elements and stuff like that so it looks really good so i was going to do some catskill mountain history but i would like to get on to, to tom's stuff so i've been trying to get a hold of the delaware aqueduct people and they have been non-cooperative, so whatever. So let's get on to the sponsors. Uh, discover Camp Catskill in Tannersville, your ultimate hiking store. Find top quality gear, apparel, and accessories for all your hiking outdoor adventures. Our expert staff is to here to help with every hiker beginning to season pros. We also carry a variety of unique Catskill souvenirs and gifts. Visit us online at campscatskill.co or in the store to gear up on your next jersey adventure starts here at camp catskill also discover the beauty of the catskills adirondack and hudson valley with scenic route guiding our expert guides are to ensure a safe unforgettable hiking experience tailored to your skill level from breathtaking vistas to hidden gems or if you're peak bagging to just simple day hikes we'll lead you on the best spots and back Put your adventure with today with explore nature's scenic splendors with scenic route guiding Check them out on all social media platforms. Also, if you mention the podcast, you can get 10% off. Use the code Mountain Lion. 
Also, if you want to embark on a transformative journey with Another Summit, Another Summit is dedicated to serving veterans and first responders with free outdoors activities. Activities like walks in nature, paddling, hiking, or even backpacking. Join our supportive community to rejuvenate in nature's embrace. Experience camaraderie, adventure, and healing at no cost. Take your next act with Another Summit and ascend to new heights of resilience and joy. Apply today on anothersummit.org. So, let's finally get to the guest of the night. Let's go! So, Tom Walsh is here to talk about his long path journey from north to south uh, for charity, correct, Tom? Uh, yes, yeah. I'm a cancer survivor. Um, I had cancer six years ago. And um, after I got cured of my cancer, I, I was actually working towards hiking the long path at the time I was, you know, started hiking and I was doing smaller hikes and I was planning my long path hike um, when I got sick. So I decided when I got better, I said, well, if I'm going to do this, this hike and, you know, this five week hike, I might as well raise some money doing it, you know, and do it, have a, have a purpose behind it. And um, I set a $5,000 goal and, and I reached it. Um, nice. Surprise. Yeah, first year. Um, actually, I was, uh, I think, 48, 84 or something, but damn close enough for me that uh, made me realize that this is something that I, I, I could do. So um, this year when I did the Long Path Southbound was actually my fifth um, annual charity challenge hike is what I call it. Um, and essentially, it's just it's a charity challenge in that it's it's got to be difficult for me. It, it can't be something that's not hard or else I would just ask people to give me money. Um, but I, I want people to donate based on me being able to complete these challenges, whatever they happen to be. And for five years, they've all involved hiking so far. And I hope they continue to involve hiking because that's what I enjoy doing. Yeah. And, um, and that, that's how I got started um, was five years ago. Um, that's and, when you and, started hiking officially or did you start? What's, what's your background of, of hiking and, and somewhat life? Well, you know, I was a Boy Scout. My family, we camped and, and uh, our, you know, our whole lives, we camped on the weekends and the holidays. And But I was never really a big hiker since I was younger. And um, I actually got into hiking because my son asked me to st- when he moved to town, he asked me if I could take his dog out for a walk a couple of days a week. So um, I said, sure. And I started grabbing the rock and we'd walk up and down the railroad tracks just a mile or so. And and then as the summer came and it started to get hotter, I said, well, we got to get off these tracks. We got to get into the woods. So then we started going to some of the state forests around here. And then I said, well, we got to hike somewhere where there's water so he can drink, you know, and, and go swimming. And and it, we just kept expanding and expanding. And, and next thing I was spending eight hour days in the woods with the rock, um, you know, going for lunch and hiking, you know, miles and miles with them. And uh, that's essentially what got me started to hiking again. And then I uh, saw the long path sign in Middleburg. I used to see it all the time. There's a big green sign says long path. And I always wondered what it was. And uh, I just decided, I guess I was about, I must have been 60 almost. And I said, you know, I'm going to check this long path thing out and decided I was going to hike from Middleburg to Thatcher Park, um, which is about 44 miles. It's the last four sections. And I got in touch with the Long Path North Hiking Club and to try and glean some information from them about the trail. But um Unfortunately, like I said earlier, most of the guys in the club are older and they're, none of them are really true hikers or anything. So it wasn't the type of information I was hoping to get from them. Um, I did most of my learning from trial and error. Um, my first attempt at Middleburg to Thatcher Park, I only lasted two and a half days um, before I completely broke down and, and had to be pretty much carried off the trail. Um, but I probably was carrying 60 pounds on my back that first trip. Yeah. Wow. Cause I had, no, yeah. I had no idea. I went out in the barn. I grabbed an old boy scout knapsack and, you know, I had blankets and tents. I even had a frying pan with me. Um, I had radio. <laughs> a what, a, what about a deep, did you bring a deep fryer for yeah, the French I'll, fries? I'll tell you, what, you, you, you wouldn't yeah. believe my pack was so heavy when I got up. It took me, 
a couple of hours just to get from Middleburg up to the top of the cliffs, going through the lemon squeeze and everything. And I literally, I dropped my map. And when I bent over to pick it up, I literally fell over top ways. I was just so <laughs> heavy. I just fell right on my head. And, uh, and anyway, I did about 10 miles first day. The second day, I did more than I wanted to. So the third day, I couldn't walk. Um, all my muscles were seized up. And um, I, I kept attempted to keep going, but eventually just had to call it off and uh, naturally had no service where I was. So I wound up walking down into the town of Bern, and, and actually there was a paramedic place down there, and she was kind enough to drive back up in the woods. And help. I left my pack stashed under a bridge because um, I couldn't carry it no more. And uh, and the bottom line was I learned a lot of valuable lessons. Um, I mean, I was wearing dungarees, work boots, cotton socks, carrying all this gear that I didn't need. And, um, and like I said, it, it was pretty much a disaster. But it like I said, I learned. And next year, I made my next trip to EMS and started buying some decent equipment and, and figuring things out. And uh, eventually, I was able to do Middleburg to Thatcher, and then I did Middleburg to Gilboa, and then I did Gilboa to Thatcher, and, and on and on. And just as I was building up with anticipation of eventually doing the long path, um, the whole thing. And uh, I was actually on the third day of my... Gilboa, I was doing Gilboa at Thatcher Park, and on my third day, my wife was supposed to come resupply me, but instead she came and got me and told me the doctor had called. I had cancer, and I had to come off the, the hike and, you know, go in and start the scans and start the process, if you will, of, of getting better. Wow. So you're, you're telling us that you're out there doing this epic long path adventure, and your wife drives up. You don't know she's coming. She drives up, and she breaks this news on you. Is that how it well, happened? I, I knew she was coming because she was going to resupply me. Um, and I had had a biopsy done on Thursday um, of the week prior. And then I left on my hike on Sunday or Saturday. I left I left on the hike and mm -hmm. with the stitches in my neck and everything. Because I, I had planned <laughs> it. I said, I'm going. And uh, she met me in Middleburg. And when she came to meet me, she said, she actually just said, the doctor called, said, you have to call him. So oh, wow. I got him. I got on the phone Ouch. and called him and he said, yep, it was cancer. He says, you got to come in tomorrow for a PET scan. And, and, um, the, the funny thing was like, I, whenever, every single time I went to see a doctor, they'd all say, how you feeling? How you feeling? Mm. I, said, I feel great. You know, I was just out doing a 70 mile hike. And, uh, I think my hiking played a large part in my being able to, to, to be alive today, if you will, um, through my sicknesses, because I was in pretty good shape. Um, if mm -hmm. I was a couch potato when I got sick, I don't know what would have happened, you know? So I really think the hiking and everything, just the general lifestyle of being in the woods really played a large part in my getting better. I really do. That is so attitude. When did yeah. you start doing like the, your, your long distance hiking? Like what, what year would you say you start doing it? Can well, like I that? said, it was all, only about seven, six years ago, maybe. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I was, um, about, well, I, when I got cancer, I was 60. All right. And so I, and I, I was doing the, um, the northern section. So I probably had been, my first long distance hike was probably a couple of months before that. Hmm. So I'm just pretty new at this game, actually. Oh, well, you're pretty good at it. <laughs> well, I'm, Jesus. I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, yeah, I, I was I had, the, I had the bucket list. I like I was looking at the Appalachian Trail, thinking maybe that'd be cool. But um, I, after reading the blogs and everything else that goes associated with that, it's just too crowded for me. Um, I'm just I'm more of a solo type guy. I don't want to get to the end of the day and have thirty people at a, at a campsite or something. You know, I right. prefer to yeah. I prefer to actually pull 150 feet off the trail and just set my tent wherever I want. You know, um, which is one of the beauties of the long path. You know, that you do have a lot of options for places to stay. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, nice. Now, <laughs> with the long path history, did you, you your first hike fully from you did you do it from south to north? Right. My first true hike was from Manhattan to Thatcher Park. Oh wow! So we we uh, if if the uh, the listeners don't know that the long path extends at this time that Tom did it from Manhattan all the way to Thatcher Park, they're extending that, correct? 
Yes, yes. Oh, okay. the, the, the current beginning is, is 175th Street and Fort Washington Avenue. There's a subway station. That's technically where the trail starts. And right now it ends at Stage Road and Thatcher. But um, Steve, as you guys know, is in the process of um, extending that down into the town of Altamont. Um, actually, the town approached the trail committee and asked if they would divert the trail to come down through their town, um, hmm. which I think is great. You know, any, any time a trail can go to a town of any sort is, is a wonderful thing for resupplies and possible places to stay and things like that. So the fact that Altamont um, stepped up and embraced the trail and said, we want the trail to come down here. I thought it was really cool. And uh, Andy, and Steve, Steve primarily, as he was telling you a few weeks ago, has been doing a lot of work. So I'm imagining it's not much longer till that'll be complete. And then the official end, if you're an end to ender, would be in, in Altamont. So what was your experience of going down all the way from, you know, Oxego County to, to Manhattan? Like, it was, it was, it was kind of, it was during COVID actually, you know, it was, uh, it was June 1st of 2020. So COVID was still, I mean, we weren't in lockdowns and such, but it was still, like when I got on the Amtrak from, from, um, Rensselaer, I took the Amtrak down to the city and then took a cab up to 175th. Um, there was nobody on the train, like, you know, and, um, when I checked into my first hotel, they actually required me to sign a form stating that I was a, a, what do they call it, you know, necessary worker or something like that, hmm. you know, that I could stay in their hotel. Um, and uh, it was so it was it was di it was a different time when I started, you know, um, there was there was people out and about. I have plenty of friendlies that I met along the way, but um, I found it to be a lot different on the trail than this time as far as um, people engaging with me in towns mm -hmm. and things like that. On the trail, it's it's fine. Everybody engages. But when you walk into a town, you stop in a diner. The first time through, every time I'd stop, people, wow, look at you. Where you going? Where you coming from? And all of that. And and this time, I, I didn't get much of that. Um, oh, wow. No, it was like every time I go to a little town or something, people, it was almost like uh, they were looking right through me. It was, um, um, it, it kind of made me wonder if, you know, people might have thought I was a homeless guy, to be honest with you. Um, I, w yeah. I was told the last two years when I did my hikes up here in the county, I, there was a lot of road walking involved in those hikes. And a couple of people I know said, we saw you, you look like a homeless guy on the side of the road. And and I, I never thought about that, but until this hike, and I realized people see me with my pack and everything. And the last thing they want to do is come up to me and say, hey, where you going? You know, not really knowing if I'm going anywhere, you know? Um, so I, I think that might've had a lot to do with the people's hesitancy. Um, I was, sure. like I said, I was in the Wordsboro diner and not one person, I had my pack right in the middle of the floor next to my table. And now not even the server was like, Oh, cool. We're, you know, what are you doing? A big hike or something like that. You know, I, I had none of that this year, which was, was definitely different. It really was. Um, like I said, on the trail was different. People see you with the pack and the bedroll and everything, and right away they they know you're at least out there for a couple of days, you know. And that's generally what they'll say. Like when I was in the Devil's Path, oh, you're doing the path, or you're doing Burroughs Range Trail or something. And when I tell them, no, I'm doing a long path, it was just like everybody would light right up. Oh, that's so cool, you know. Everybody thought it was great, and um, I liked it because whenever I call these type of people friendlies, and whenever I meet a friendly. I'd always, no matter where I was or what I was going through, I would always step away from that with a bounce in my step. It always, I'd always walk away just thinking that was really cool. You know, these people are rooting for me and, and it would always just kind of spur me to go further, you know? Yeah, so definitely. Um, a lot of these type, at least for me, a lot of the hike was, was about the people and the encounters. And uh, I have two books, one's full of pictures of waterfalls and valleys and fire towers, and the other one's full of people. And when I show them to people and they look and they're like, they look at this waterfall, oh, that's beautiful. Where's that? I don't know. It's in the mountains somewhere. You know what I mean? I, I really don't know these mountains like you would think I would from the way I hike them. But when I see a picture of a person and they say, who, I know exactly who it was, where we talked about, you know, the whole thing. So my memories are definitely more aligned with 
with the folks I met along the way than than the sites I saw. So, nice. so Tom, let me just have you backtrack there. Sure. You said you said you have two books of photos. Did I hear that right? Yeah, two. You know, I, I made photo albums from the hike. Yeah, I got you. Do you carry these on the trail? Is that what I'm hearing? No, 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 oh, no. It's okay, just, so this yeah, is just like caught. Yeah, trust right. me. They, if yeah. they weigh something, I'm not carrying them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because that that came across as like yeah, very old school. You're hiking along with your knapsack, and you pull out these books of photos. So, all right. <laughs> so what? Why don't we uh, talk about you? You told us that first experience you lasted two point five days. How did you your gear change from that first? 2.5 day experience to when you you took the Amtrak down to New York City, the taxi over to 175 and set out to hike northbound on the long trail the first time? Um, to be honest, from that very first hike to my first long path, the, the gear didn't change much um, as far as what I had. I mean, obviously, I, I went out and bought a nice pack. I bought an Osprey um, that I really like. Um but uh, uh, it was mostly just discarding stuff, you know, it mm -hmm. was just mostly stuff that I didn't need that when I first started hiking, I would bring stuff saying, oh, maybe I may might need this, you know, and then after you hike a few hikes, you come to realize, no, you don't need that, you know, or you do need this. Um, truth be told, my first hike, I had a 1999 Walmart tent and I had a 1999 Walmart sleeping bag. Um, that weighed three pounds and my tent was maybe four and a half pounds. It was just a little pup tent. Um, and I loved the hell out of it. You know, it kept me dry. Um, but I was probably still on my first hike. I had set myself up for weekly resupplies. I started in Manhattan and then I had my first resupply in, um, I believe it was in Walwasing. And then my next one was in Palinville and, I was being resupplied once a week, but that meant when I started up, I was carrying seven days worth of food, um, which was a lot, you know, and I was probably mm -hmm. carrying in the neighborhood of 35 pounds most days on that first hike. Not bad. Uh, four years later, I've come to realize I can't carry that type of weight anymore. And I, I did this year, I upgraded even more. I bought an Enlightenment quilt. I bought a big Agnes tent. Um, nice. I, I, yeah, I upgraded a lot of stuff and I got... And I did my stashes and I had a bounce box. So I was never carrying more than three days of food at any one time. Um, but still, when I did Devil's Path, I had three days of food and a gallon of water on board. So I was probably between 32 to 35 pounds at that point. Um, it seems whenever I had my hardest climbs was when I had my most weight, you know. Um, but as far as the gear goes, that's just you know, learn is a, I, I am definitely a gram counter now. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I look at everything, I weigh everything. Um, and I just can't get myself, I mean, without spending a couple of thousand dollars, um, I can't get myself much lighter than I am right now. I think where I am right now is, is about as light as I'm going to get. So what's that weight? What's your like, well, well my base weight is probably in the 11 to 12 pound range. And, and then, uh, you know, you throw in my, my cook kit and my clothes and, and everything else. Like I said, with three days worth of food and, um, I was trying to carry about two liters of water with me most times. I would probably sit in that 25 pound range. Mm -hmm. So and that's, and, that's, and that's that seems manageable. No, that's very yeah. manageable for me. Yes. Um, so how big is the pack? How many liters is your pack? It's a 58 liter. Oh, and wow. It seems like a pretty big pack for that kind of weight. Or am uh, I wrong? Not really. It's an, it's an Osprey um, uh, Exos, I think it's called. Uh, I've had it five years now. It's pretty much beat up pretty good now. It's been through five hikes. Um, but it's it's actually the, the, the almost the perfect size for, for my gear. Um, nice. I have most of my gear in, in little little sacks. So it's really just a matter of I have my cook kit in this, my my hygiene in this, and my clothes in that, and my and then I just open the pack and I just you know pop everything in there. It uh, and it actually fits um, pretty pretty snug. It's a pretty nice fit for me. Wow! So your recent expedition on the long path that you went from north to south, right? Yes. How long did that take? That was thirty seven days. 37 the, days. First wow. was, the first one was 34 days, um, 
with 30 with four days off so it was 12 miles a day average and this one was 37 and again i think i took four days um the one big push i did was i um I, I took some time off in Ellenville and then three days later, I, I actually took a day off to go canoeing on the Delaware river because <laughs> the long path passes right by the Delaware. And I've been going canoeing with my family and friends every year since 1976. Actually, I haven't missed the year in 49 mm. years and nice. I wasn't going to miss this year. So I kind of scheduled my hike so that I would be in Otisville on the weekend of the canoe trip. And then somebody just, I actually walked over to the hometown deli from, uh, from Basha Kill and bummed a ride to the campground six miles up the road and on Friday. And then Saturday spent the day canoeing with my family and friends. We had about 30 people this year. It was great. And then Sunday, somebody dropped me back off at Basha Kill and I just picked it back up again. And I went from that Sunday right through to the end the following Tuesday. I did 10 days straight through without taking a zero. Which for me was, was, I was going to take a zero, but once I got down Mount Ivy, I'm like a couple of days out. I was like, I got to just, you know, push through this. So, yeah. um, so did you feel that 37 days was perfect or would you like to minimize it or, you know, extend it? What, uh, you know, from, from, uh, where I'm at physically, um, I probably, could have done it a little – I could have probably knocked a day or two off, especially at the end because I had my trail legs towards the end. Um, but that sometimes I just – like I was in um, just above Harriman, and I was looking at my my things, and I really said, you know, from here I might be able to bang this out in about five days. And I took seven, you know, because rather than doing five 15-mile days, let's do seven tens, you know, and, and, and take it mm -hmm. easy, you know. And, Enjoy and, it, right? Why push, you know? Um, I did a lot of pushing on the, on this hike. There, there were some brutal, brutal days. I mean, there were some days where I, I was averaging half a mile an hour. Um, that's oh, how slowly wow. I was moving. Yeah. Yes. There, there were, there were some what, brutal was days. that the heat, the humidity? A combination of everything. The, the hardest yeah. days were in the Catskills, and it was primarily because of the climbs and the descents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I did start off on June 17th. So my first four days was in that first heat wave that we had. Oh. And, uh, yeah, I actually, I took a zero, I, I hiked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then I took a zero day Friday, which I had planned. And I came home because I was only 20 minutes from the house and I had lost six pounds in that first four days. Hmm. And, um, the next week I took another zero. I lost another four or five. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Well, I started a little heavy, which, you know, I had a little bit more weight on me than I probably should have. Um, but by the, by the end of the hike, I dropped just over 20 pounds and, um, I actually ate like a madman in the last four days. So I would imagine I was probably down over 25 pounds at one point. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, one thing I'm curious about, Tom, is how, how does the, the camping arrangements or overnight arrangements differ in Orange and Rockland County versus upstate? Uh, well, it, it's probably a little bit more difficult um, down there than up here because up here you, you got so much state land. You can just, like I said, just pop 150 feet off the trail and you can set up wherever you want. Mm -hmm. um, my big advantage was having Andy Garrison um, as one of my, my, I have what I call the big three, which was Andy, Cami, and Christina. And um, they're the ones who did my bounce box for me. Andy picked me up in uh, Platte Clove with my bounce box and he met, went all the way down to Middletown and then handed it off to Cami and then she handed it off to Christina down into Harriman. Um, and one of them was meeting me essentially every two to three days with mm -hmm. my bounce box to resupply me. And Andy knows all the places to stay. You know what I'm oh, saying? Yeah. He, 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 I mean, there was a couple of stealth places where I wasn't supposed to be, but Andy would be like, Oh, don't worry. This is a good spot. And, um, on the state land. And he's also involved with OSI, which has a lot of properties along the trail too. And so he would put me in OSI properties, uh, uh probably spent four or five nights in OSI properties, which Tom, is Tom, even, one sec. What is OSI? Um, open spaces initiative. I think it's called or open spaces Institute. Nice. Um, I, I believe it's open space initiatives and it's a, it's a nonprofit that purchases properties 
across the Catskills, you know, with the intent of eventually making them public. Um, mm-hmm. I believe they try and purchase, particularly if they can find stuff butting up with the state land and things like that. Um, and they've got properties everywhere. OSI is huge and Andy's very involved with them. So, I mean, Andy's the type of guy where I could call him up and say, Andy, I'm in section 22 and I'm lost. And he'll, t- he'll say to me, what are you looking at? And I could say, I'm looking at a big tree with a rock next to it. And he knows like exactly where I am. I mean, he knows every inch of this trail. Um, he is such an asset um, to this trail. I said, I, I did a, a talk with somebody earlier today. And I was saying that there's no doubt friends in a long path got me through this hike. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not too proud to say, oh, I did. I had a, at least a dozen people that helped me in one way or another during this hike. And whether it was giving me a ride from the trailhead to my hotel or finding a place for me to stay the very first night I got to where I was going to stay. And I was like, it's early. Maybe I should push on. I called Steve Seagart. He made a call to one of the landowners. Yeah. He can set his tent up here. Um, A few days later, Bobby and Lori uh, found me a spot to camp up. Bobby and Lori had it. Yeah, up off Bluebird Road. They were like, oh, we know this guy. We'll call him. And it was like, yeah, you can set a tent there. And like I said, people, Russ Russ from uh, the hiking club met me up in Cotton Hill with a, with a veal parmesan hero and two gallons of water, you know. Um, so the, I, I certainly couldn't have done this hot, hot hike without without the help I got. Like I said, I, I feel that um, Christina and Cammy pretty much the last week to t- eight days, they really nursed me right through that, that whole bottom section. They came out and hiked with me a couple of days and, uh, you know, walk with me. And, and uh, it was, it, it was just really cool when I actually, my very last day, Christina um, picked me up at the hotel in Nyack, brought me to the state line um, to the to the administration building where I'd finished the day before and she picked me up and brought me to the hotel. And then she proceeded to walk the whole 10 miles with me to the end of the section on 175th Street. And a couple wow. of miles in, yeah, we were in walking a couple of miles in and here comes Cammy. She met us and she walked in. And then all of a sudden here comes Sean Gitlin. I don't know if you're familiar with Sean, but he's done the long path three times. He's through hiked the long path. Oh, wow. Um I think in three separate seasons. He just recently did it this winter. He did it in February and March. And um, what it, this is a quick story, but I did attempt to hike the long path southbound in 2021. After I did it northbound the very next year, I said, I'm going to be the first person to do it both ways. And um, I wound up injuring my calf um, outside Phoenicia. And when I got to the base of Wittenberg, I decided to call the hike off and went down to Woodland Valley. Um, and it was it was a hard decision, but I couldn't risk getting hurt up on the Burroughs Range. So I decided to call it. But two nights prior to that, I was staying up on Tramper Mountain at the lean-to, and that's when I met Sean Gitlin. And he was doing a northbound hike at that time. And I told him how I was going to be the first guy to do it both ways and all of this stuff. And and he thought that was great. And anyway, this year when I was planning what to do for my charity challenge, I had narrowed it down to a couple of hikes, um, the long path being one of them. And when Sean was doing his northbound hike, Andy asked him, he said, you know, this is your third time. How come you haven't gone southbound? And he said, because I know Tom wants to be the first one to do it both ways. Nice. <laughs> right. And yeah. I, I was just yeah. like, well, I guess I know what I'm doing this year then, you know. And <laughs> it kind of sealed the deal for me um, as to what I was going to do. And that, that made it so much nicer for him to come out on my last day and walk with me the last few miles across the bridge and all, you know, um, to have him and Cammy and Christina, who both, um, just a few months ago, completed their end to ends, um, wow. which is which is how I know them because when they came up to the northern end, I shuttled them a couple of times and went hiking with them a couple of times. So that's how I met them, you know. And um, so having this this kind of like enthusiasm with the other people gives you kind of that inspiration to to kick ass and to finish it. Well, it really did. It really did. Um, the, uh, Christina in particular at one point when I was about a week, a week from the end, 
Um, again, I was dealing with rashes and blisters, and it was going to be pouring rain this particular night. And her and Cammy had came and walked with me for, for a while and to resupply me. And when the rain started, um, Christina was just like, well, that's it. You're not, you're coming home. You're coming to my house. And she called her husband, Anthony, and he was very gracious. And they brought me home and I got to sleep in a warm bed and take a shower. And, and, um, I don't know if I had to camp in the rain that night. And wake up the next morning and put on wet shoes and socks and wet clothes. And with the blisters I was dealing with, I don't know how much further I would have went that day. So okay. that little bit of kindness on her part was, was, was changing, was, you know, changed the whole hike for me. It, it was amazing. It was amazing. That's why I refer to them as the big three because yeah. Andy, Cammy and Christina just, Pretty much the whole way through, they were just there almost every day. I could call one of them or see one of them. And uh, like I said, a lot of people are like uh, supported and unsupported hikes and all of that. I I got no problem. I'm not proud about it. <laughs> I mean, I had a lot of help and I don't think I could have done it without it. And that's all there is to it. So, sounds like a, uh, it's about the connections. That's what yeah, makes we, it happen. I, I, I had an interview this morning with um with a magazine um called Hook Magazine down out of Nyack. Um a guy called me up about my hike and, and I told him just that he asked me about the, the community and the long path community yeah. is just it's tremendous. Um friends to the long path Facebook page. If anybody's gonna hike the long path, do yourself a favor and join up with the friends of the long path because the resources you can get from that page are just astronomical. Um, you know, Catskill trail conditions obviously is a great, great um, site for, for finding out about water sources and things like that. But if you want to learn anything long path, go on friends of the long path and all you got to do is post, say, I'm going to go up and do section so-and-so any chance someone could give me a ride and you'll get responses. You'll get hmm. people from the, from the area saying, Oh yeah, I can meet you. And I've met, people at six o'clock in the morning and just drove them 10 miles back to so they could start a section you know and um always just did it because this is what i do where I, i'm up here and then sure enough like i said to christine you know give a girl a couple of rides and next thing you're sitting in her kitchen eating a hero you know so <laughs> um, it you know oh. it, it, it the long path community i think is is tremendous. I, I really think that the the people that are involved in it, Cammy and Christina both do trail maintenance. Cammy, I think, is actually a trail supervisor in one section, um, and obviously Andy is uh, he's he's the probably the biggest asset that I would say that this trail has. Yeah. So, Tom, uh, I have two questions before we get to the question that was on the top of my mind. I just want to make sure that the folks at hook magazine don't outdo us. So is there anything <laughs> that they asked you or you told them Jesus. that you haven't covered? So we're, so we don't I'm get out scooped. You know, I, I, I think it was the guy was writing a story about the long path essentially. And he mm -hmm. saw that I had just completed it. And that's why he called me to get some insight from me. We did talk for quite a while, but again, it was, um, it's like he wanted, you know, what, what do you tell people who want to hike the long path? And this is what I said to you, you know, get on Facebook and uh, and and look around and, and on friends in the long path, I mean, and, and you're going to find all the resources you need. I mean, the, the long path is it's amazing because of all the different I don't know the right word, but it's like the ecosystems, if you will, where it goes from Manhattan to the depths of the Catskills. And then mm -hmm. when you get up north here, it's a whole different world, even from the Catskills. Yeah. So, the and, and that's, that was my other question. So you, you've spent 37 days on trail through a variety of conditions, rain, heat, humidity, the devil's path, um, the Harriman uh, rail trail through Goshen, but eventually you, you make your way across the George Washington bridge. You're in New York City. What do you do? You've lost all that weight. What do you, I mean, what do you do? Do you go out for dinner? Did you go out for lunch? I mean, what is the shebang at the end of this epic journey? Actually, the shebang at the end of the journey, I, I think I got to the subway station around two o'clock, maybe quarter to two. And I was in um, Croton on the Hudson getting on an Amtrak by 3.05. That and, was and that's it. You, you, I nothing, just heard, nothing I, special? 
No, no. But like I said, it was great to have Cammy and Sean and and what and Christina with me, and mm-hmm. and we took some photos at the subway station. And then I was like, all right, now I got to get home. And uh, Sean um, went online and and ordered me an Uber. I, I got an Uber. Came. We was there in like two minutes. Picked me up and he ran me up to Amtrak. And I was home by uh, six thirty. You know, um, wow. having dinner at my own house. You know, it was yeah. I I, I just. I, I couldn't decide should I stay an extra night in the city and then go home mm-hmm. tomorrow or, you know, how to play this. Yeah. And um, I just said, you know what? I got a chance to make that particular train. I'm mm-hmm. going to go for it. You know? Yeah. yeah. I find it interesting that you're, you're out there for 37 days. You, you end up in New York city, any type of food imaginable, any, you know, the, the city's got all these wonderful things to do. And you just want to get home because there's no place yeah. like home. Is that is that it you wanted to get back to the grandkids? It, 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 yeah, it, it, it was. It was. It was. You know, really, was all that I wanted to do. I, I had no other thoughts in my. I, I been looking at bus schedules, and you know, maybe mm-hmm. I can take a bus to this and that and that. And then when I saw, I mean, it cost me over a hundred bucks for an Uber to get wow. up to the, to the train oh, station. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's New York City for you. Yeah, I didn't care at that point. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I was just like, you know, a uh, hundred bucks at this point. I'll be on a train in an hour. I'll be home in three, four hours. It was, it was just weird getting on a train with a lot of people on it and stuff. Because like I said, with the your, last time with your massive honest. backpack. Yeah, 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 and and not smelling the sweetest either. I'm sure. <laughs> um, I'm sure that was an issue too. So my next question, Tom, is uh, Stasha's wife is planning uh, an excursion for him to spend uh, 40 days on the long path and she wants to know should she send him northbound starting off in new york city or should she send him southbound starting at thatcher park and heading south which which for you um is the best way to go if you're only going to do it one time well, they say the southbound is downhill most of the way so um but i don't know if i can agree with that <laughs> i would say that Looking at both of them, for me, the northbound was the easier of the two hikes. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's nice that you have almost two weeks of hiking before you hit the hard stuff. Um, you know what I mean? You're coming through, you go through Rockland County, there's not a hill over a thousand feet. And then you get into Orange County, there's nothing over 2,000 feet. So it, you, you're, you're giving yourself some time to build up before you start getting into the real hills. Whereas when you start at Thatcher, it's only a matter of days till you're into some serious climbs. And I mean, nothing scrambles or nothing, but mm-hmm. you're in the mountains immediately, you know. And yeah. um, the other thing for me, from a, from a, a mental standpoint, <clears throat> was when I did it northbound, like I said, I had a- Andy. I-, I knew Andy because he showed up at a couple of hiking club meetings up here. Um, so I knew who he was, but I didn't really know Andy. And when I started my hike, um, I might have been on my second day, third day at the latest. I ran into Andy. He came and met me on the trail. And um, he was with me that first hike from there all the way to Wyndham. I saw him, if not every day. I spoke to oh, him wow. almost every day. Oh, Andy was, he, he was tremendous for me. And I wasn't doing Facebook or nothing back then. So he was posting online, you know, um, where I was and what I was doing and everything. And that's how people knew when they saw me, knew who I was. Um, but the biggest difference mentally was Andy would say to me, like, um, I'll give you a quick instance. Um, I was in Phoenicia and he told me he, he wanted me to make it to Mink Hollow lean to that day. And it was, I think it was about That's 17 a tough or 18 climb. Hike. Yeah, it's a good hike. But That's he explained, good climb. he said, the next day you've got to go to the Devil's Path and I want you to start at Mink Hollow. So I want you to get to Mink Hollow. And so I, I did. I got to Mink Hollow. And then the next day I did Devil's Path. And the beauty for me was, I wasn't familiar with the trail at all. So all I knew every day when I woke up in the morning, all I knew was I had a hard day in front of me. I knew I have to go up mountains. I have to go down mountains. I have a hard day in front of me. But this year when I did it, I knew exactly how hard those days were going to be. Because now I know the mountains in front of me. You know, like when I did the Devil's Pass the first time, I had no idea what I was getting into. (laughs) I just just did it. You know, yeah. I just did it. 
This yeah. year, I knew exactly what I was getting into, so it was it was you know th- that much harder to to get motiv- you know to get motivated for it. Um, I don't know if I said earlier, but one of the things I truly hate is going up mountains. Um, <laughs> I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I certainly took up the wrong hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, but Time I have on the wrong podcast. This is called the yeah, Catskill Mountains yeah. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Two words I hate in the long path guide are ascend steeply. Um, <laughs> it just, I, it's just, I, you know, I mean, obviously I've come to accept it. Um, I get to mountains like when I did the, you know, I started at Devil's Kitchen and went up, uh, uh, you know, in, in the long path, uh, the Devil's Path. I mean, you're right, um, Indian just, head. Yep, you're right. Yep, and I just get to the bottom and I look up and I just say, okay, we got to do this. Let's do it. And, and, and I just, and I just do it. You know, um, there are times where my feet are literally moving four inches at a time. Um, I do have compromised lungs from when I was sick earlier. Um, I, 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 when I had the cancer, I did, I wound up on life support for five days in, in, in the hospital. And, um, I had some really rough, rough times. Um, so I do have some, some physical limitations, if you will. Um, but I don't let that limit me. If, if you understand what I'm saying, um, I, I, I know all about that. So, yeah, yeah. I just, I just, you know, I want to keep going. For me, I'll be honest with you. This podcast, this interview this afternoon, um, the only on a rotary asked me to speak at a luncheon stage. So, um, these things, I'll do all of them if they can generate more interest and more money in my charities. You know, yeah. um, in, in, in this <laughs> case, certainly I love the idea that it's bringing more, more, um, interest to the long path and, and more stuff about the long path, because I think that's good that we get more people out there. But for me, the bottom line is I'm trying to raise money for charities. So if I can do a podcast like this and say, you know, if you go online to otsegooutdoors.org, there is a, um, a link on there with a story about me. If you want to donate, you can go on there and donate some money to these charities. And if I can generate another couple hundred bucks by talking to somebody, I'll do it all day long. You know, so one question, Tom, when you did the devil's path, did you at least have views? Did I have views? Yeah. From the peaks. Yes. Yes, I did. Oh, Uh, okay. Good, good. Well, then it's a, it's a, then it's an actual like benefit for you. Yeah, Wittenberg is one of my favorite peaks. It uh, it really is. um, Unfortunately, uh, I'm sorry, not Wittenberg is Burroughs Range. Right. Yeah. Um, um, Indian head uh, twin plateau. Right. Twin is just twin is just beat the hell out of me. Um, oh, especially, yeah. especially going down, going down on the south side of Twin. Uh, that that well, really Tom. I not I to was, interrupt you, that is one of the steepest sections of the Catskills that you can ever face. So don't don't feel bad about it. Well, I know I was up on top and I was looking down through this big hole that went down, and I was like, "This can't possibly be the trail" because I didn't see any blazes. <laughs> and, and I hear from all the way down the bottom, I hear, "Oh yes, it is." Somebody yelling up, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. And I that was, was like, God well, speaking to you. <laughs> you know, um, I had to take my pack off to get up the Cornell crack, and and then tie a rope to it and pull it up behind me. Um, wow. Bur- Burroughs Range was was one of my hardest days because it was raining. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I got to experience my first Catskill deluge, which I'd never had the the um, the experience Tell us about it. Yeah. Uh, well, I was heading from Phoenicia. I was planning to to camp. There's a little site about eight tenths of a mile before you get to the Wittenberg base of Wittenberg. There, um, there's a campsite up to the left. Yep. And it started raining. I don't know about an hour before I was there, and I was sweated right through. So I didn't even put my poncho on. And, um, when I got to the site there, it was, there was actually a big tent there. It was like a party going on or something, but everything was, was about four or five inches underwater. And, um, I got in there and I, I just, I had no poncho. I couldn't set my rain up, my tent up in the rain. So I was literally just standing with my hands on my pole in the pouring (laughs) rain. Wow. Um, and I said, you know, I can't, I, I can't do this. So I decided, made an executive decision and decided to head for the, um, mountain terrace lean to. I says, I know I got a mile to the base of Wittenberg and then a 1.2 to, to the lean to. So let's, let's go there. And I got to hike on a trail where the water was shin deep running down the mm. trail. It was like walking through a creek. Um, I'd seen videos of that before, but 
I didn't really get to experience until this time that, you know, there comes a point where you're not even thinking about staying dry anymore. Um, yeah. You're just sloshing through knee deep water. Um, it's, it, it was truly, I was able to drink by just putting my, my, my head up and opening my mouth and it, it was raining so hard. I was able to drink like that. Um, and then the next day, Obviously, to now the first thing I got to do is hump the mile point two up out of the lean two just to get to the base of Wittenberg. And then it took me close to an hour and a half to do the 1.1 miles up to Wittenberg. And One that the, was the, everybody, you know, I, I got to say that that spot is one of the most difficult in the Catskills. And I'd have to say that that is one of the most unexpected in the Catskills. So, and I got to do it in the rain. Yeah, with the, with your pack probably two three pounds heavier than what it was supposed to be. Well, I was loaded. I I loaded up with water. Um, I knew I wasn't going to find water to the other side of slide. I think is where I found the water. Um, so I I had to load up, and I was what I did when Phoenicia. I picked up an extra liter and a half bottle, an empty one. So now I had two liter and a halfs and another single liter. So I was able to carry four liters with me. But again, that's, you know, that's an extra eight pounds on your back now, eight, nine pounds. Um, and Wittenberg, obviously, there was no views because of the rain. Um, it didn't stop raining till I was going down slide, heading down towards the Neversink was when it finally stopped raining on me. Um, but that when I got to the top of Wittenberg, uh, that was when I made a call to Andy because I was I was having trouble breathing. I was I was whooped. I was whooped. And I I. I I couldn't see 20 feet because of the clouds. And I called Andy and he was just, you know, he's just like, well, you got that one done. It's not so bad going down. And then Cornell's not too bad. And then you got water on slide. And, <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, okay. You know, and, and I just, just took off. There was a, it was, um, what do they call him? A steward up on slide, I think. Yeah. So when I got Andy told me, Oh, there's a guy up on slides. So when you saw that gave me something to hike towards anyway, you know, and, um, he had some bandages cause I had a broken finger for the whole hike. So he had some stuff for me and, uh, helped me out a little bit, but, uh, that was another one of, one of those turning points, if you will, on that, on my hike that, um, you know, they call bonking. Um, unfortunately my nutrition on the trail is horrendous. And I probably spend my whole day bonking. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, just, it's just like one big bonk is my whole day. I drink a five hour energy at some point during the day. I have my electrolytes, but it's very difficult for me. Like when I got to that Terrace Mountain lean to, um, I had been carrying a, a sub that I bought in Phoenicia and I just, I just didn't want to eat. You know, when I got there, I was just like, I, I just had no appetite. I was just understandable. Exhausted. So what'd you do with what'd you do with the sub? Did you feed it to the bears, the raccoons? No, I actually ate, the half, of it in, ate yeah. half of it for breakfast, actually, um, because I knew I had to get something in me. I had a big mm -hmm. day in front of me, you know, and I know how it works. Carbs are for tomorrow. And the day before, I didn't really carb up very well. You know, I had good breakfast at Brio's and all, so that certainly helped. Um, but my nutrition is is my downfall. It really is. It, one of the things is I'm a meat and potato guy. So uh, finding trail stuff is difficult for me because I don't eat vegetables and stuff like that. So um, it's a lot of oatmeal and potatoes and noodles and stuff like that. But I just that's why whenever I get to a town, I just I just go to town, you know, if you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you got when you got to New York City, you you just headed home. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Went from the city to the home. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I did. Yeah, I was able to get a couple of Mike's hot dogs up in Schenectady when I got off the train, so that was good for me. But no, so. but no soggy water dogs down in Manhattan. <laughs> I That's tell you okay. what, I love them. I love yeah. them dogs. If, if I if I saw a card, I probably would have stopped. My car just pulls over when it sees the umbrella. I can't stop it. <laughs> um, those are great. Them sabrets are great. Dirty water dogs. Yeah. So, so Tom, you you had some, uh, uh, as you can say, tough times and and the, and the Catskills and such like that. But what about this hiking for charity stuff? Why, why, why do this? Why go the extra <laughs> mile? No, that that's like I said, that started because when I had cancer, when I was having my chemo treatments, um, speaking with the nurses and things, I, I had one particular chemo drug that had to be actually had to be hand infused. 
Um, and it took about 20, 25 minutes. So I called it the getting to know you drug because the nurse would literally sit in a chair right here with this huge syringe and just push a little bit every couple of minutes. And, wow. and so we talked and, and that's when I found out about how many other people in the room with me were struggling. Um, you know, um, couldn't, have, didn't have money to get to their treatments, to get a cab, um, couldn't make their co-pays, couldn't pay electric bills. Um, there was just so much, you know, that, that these people could use that I said, well, if I'm going to do this crazy hike, I'm going to raise some money for these people then. And, um, the first couple of years, I, I decided right off the bat, I'm going to split it between two charities. I didn't want to just give it all to one, but I didn't want to split it five ways and have the amount of monies be too small to really make a difference. So I said, let's do two charities. In the first two years, I gave half the money to a charity called Tunnel to Towers, which is out of the city, and they pay off the mortgages of first responders who are killed in the line of duty. Um, they have since expanded their mission statement. Now they, they build smart homes for disabled veterans. They take care of gold star families. Um, it's a huge, huge organization. Tunnel to Towers. It was, um, founded by the brother of a firefighter killed in 9-11, who actually ran from Brooklyn through the battery tunnel to the towers because he was off that day and then was wow. killed when the towers collapsed. Um, so I, I gave half the money to them for a couple of years. And then I met these folks from uh, Seagull Outdoors when I did the Super Octet Challenge. And um, they were such nice people, Peggy and Ellen and, and Jennifer. And I said to them, well, maybe next year I'll, I'll raise money for you guys, you know. And um, they did such a great job of promoting and, and everything and setting up websites and everything that I've just I've just stuck with them. And, nice. and for, the, for the hospital, I give... I go back and forth. What I want to do is half one year I give to the cancer patients and the next year I wanted to, my plan was to give it to ICU for the same reasons. Cause like when I was in ICU, my wife could get in the car and go home, but there are other people who God forbid, you know, they have a loved one they're out of town or something and they need a place to stay or, or food for meals or things like that. So I wanted to designate the money to that. And then I came to find out that Bassett Hospital in Cooperstown actually has, they call it the Hannah Lee House. And it's like their own little Ronald McDonald house. So I give the money to the Hannah Lee House one year and then the cancer patients the next year. So I go back and forth with that. And I see you outdoors. So I've, I've given to four or five different charities. Now I've raised 25000 um, now in five years. So it's how, it's, how much? Wow. How much was that again, Tom? Let's what? just hear that what? number again. I've raised over twenty five thousand. Holy wow. shit! That's it's so you're doing. You're doing over five k a year. Exactly. Hike, hiking for charities. Well, kudos to you, buddy. That's yes. that's real impressive. And, and I, yeah. I hope to do it as as long as I physically can. And yeah, that's one great. of the things about it being a charity challenge is it's a charity challenge hike, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a hike. Um, mm -hmm. I actually looked at bicycling um, after the, after last year. I was like, maybe I could try bicycling, and then I won't have to Patrick, catch your man to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got a bad bad neck and shoulders and things, so I've got stenosis in my neck. I've got arthritis, and so carrying even twenty five pounds is getting difficult. Um, but I I bought a bike, a nice little seven speeder, and and I don't like it. I don't. I'm no. sorry. I just, <laughs> It's too much like yeah. running. I mean, you yeah. really, you just got your constant, you know, you got, I mean, it's great when you're on the downhills and you can coast and stuff. That's real nice. You're, killing me. you're killing me, Tom. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm, bleeding, totally. I'm bleeding out here. I'm, this is I'm, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, somebody, I, no, somebody I, get I, the defibrillators. I'm down. I, I can't do the bike. I, 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 I yeah. think, um, cause what I was looking at was the empire trail. So I yeah. was thinking a bike would be perfect for that, you know? Um, yeah. but no, I can't do the bike. So it's going to, so like Tad, looks earlier, like you got to do this. Yeah. So, so Take Tom, place. yeah. So Tom, I, we, we see people all the time, uh, with the best of intentions setting out to raise money for charity. And what, what's your pro tips? I mean, somebody who's done 25 K in five years, uh, with their, their, you know, uh, backpack on huffing and puffing a cancer survivor, huffing and puffing, you know, up and down the devil's path through the Catskills, uh, you know, uh, right down to Manhattan. What's your advice to somebody who wants to get out and do what you're doing, you know, hike for charity? Um, 
I, I think it's passion. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be passionate about what you want to do. Um, I, I truly believe in these organizations. I, I truly believe that they do a lot of good. Um, and, and, and that makes it really easy. Um, when one of the reasons when I did my first hike, I mean, this year I had almost $10 per mile sponsored. That's how I, that's wow. how I raise money is wow. I have people cool. me for every mile. Yeah. That's about how much it costs me to drive my car, by the way, 10, 10 bucks a mile for my <laughs> Jeep. I'm just, I'm just saying that, but all right, Tom, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, that's but, all right. It's, yeah. um, it just, I mean, these hikes have cost me over the years. Sometimes they can cost me a pretty penny out of my own pocket. Mm -hmm. Obviously this year with the upgraded gear and then hotel rooms and food and everything, you know, sometimes I wonder if I'm not better off just giving all that money to charity and not hike it at all. Um, but it, 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 you have to, when I go out, like, like I said, I had almost 10 miles, uh, uh, $10 a mile. So when I wake up in the morning and I say, today I'm going to hike so far, I know I'm going to raise a hundred and something dollars today. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. I hike 50 miles, I'm going to raise $150 today, you know, and every day you're raising money when you have something like that. Mm -hmm. That's what, like I said, if, if I was doing something that wasn't difficult to do, well, then I would just say, hey, listen, I'm collecting money for charity. Give me money. Um, but the whole point is I've got to finish these challenges and then people give me the money, you know, mm -hmm. um, based on on my challenge. Um, yeah. and, and so, Tom, if I if I heard you correct and I want to make sure we get this out there, even though you finished your southbound um, long path challenge, people can still donate. To yes, they can. Yes, I'm, I'm going to, the website will be up and uh, the link will be up probably for a few months yet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's at seagooutdoors.org. If you just go to that and they'll see, you'll see these various stories and there's a story about me. And they actually, um, I have what I call a spot, my GPS for when I hike, I carry a spot on my pack and mm -hmm. it beeps every 10 minutes. And I got it originally for my wife because she can just look on her phone and see right where I am. And um, I was able to go public with it this year. So at Seagull Outdoors was able to post actually a link to that. And anybody could go on their phone and see where I was or, and where I had been by looking at my spot account, which I thought was really cool this year. Yeah. It, brought, it brought a lot more. Like I said, being I was out of town, it brought a lot more people involved, I think. I think I'm going to set a record this year for money gained. Uh, mm -hmm. Money earned, I mean. Yeah. Um, well, let's, I, nice. let's, let's, let's have our, yeah, our listeners. Let's. I'm going to. I'm going to look that up and, and chip in. And I think all of well, our I listeners. That. I, I did want to say, if I could, um, I thought of this while I was hiking down, down South on the long path. Um, you know, somebody in Nyack or somebody down South um, says, you know, by Bear Mountain or something, say, meet me and say, well, why should I give you money, you know, for, for trails up by you or, or, Cancer and and you know something I I I agree I understand where you're coming from so if that's what you think do me a favor and donate to your local hiking club or donate to your local um cancer society you know what I'm saying if you think what I'm doing is is a good thing but you would rather not donate to money to something hundreds of miles away I understand that then just do me a favor and donate to the one in your town yeah exactly that's the way i yeah. uh, so it's the way we we promote stuff here on uh inside the line it's just donate your time or donate your money to local organ organizations you know it gets shit done it, it it either helps the trails or helps the the community it's just the same thing as you tom it's just you have, you have the kind of the same mindset as i do uh Tad, I don't know. You got to start this this cycle challenges crap that Tom was thinking about. Man, I'm putting you to the test. Yeah, I, I was I was to do that. Um, Canal Empire Trail two summers ago with my brother in law. But then, oh, did you do the Empire Trail? Well, I was. We were planning on it, and then you know he had all these heart problems and had to get some stents and and bailed out on me. So, well, it's a little early to. To leak it out, but I'm actually thinking of doing it next year for my challenge. Oh yeah, look at that. Well, do it together. Look, look, do it. Yeah, look. Yeah, look me up. Maybe we'll we'll do it together. Well, no, no, I'm gonna walk it. Oh, you're walk walking it. Well, maybe yes. I'll ride. Maybe I'll ride it. You can walk it. We'll go at about the same pace. <laughs> it, 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 it's an issue because the trail is set up for bikers. It's it's yeah. not set up for hikers. Um, uh, you know, I'm looking at maybe Buffalo to Albany or something like that. Yeah. Um, 
That's is a fucking beauty incredible, of, though. Jesus. The, <laughs> yeah. the beauty of it is there's no mountains. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think the, the the net change in elevation is like under a thousand feet. <laughs> yeah, for the whole no thing. shit. And I'm actually thinking of putting some wheels on my backpack and pulling it behind me. Yeah. That, I mean, Tom, I think if you did the the long path, you could probably do that, the Empire Trail, with a breeze. Well, it's the same distance. It's, it's actually from um, Buffalo to Albany is 360 miles. So oh, no it, it shit. Would be, yeah, it would be about the same distance. Actually, I was considering just banging into another 40 miles down to Cairo or something and making it an even 400. Um, we'll have to see how I feel next year. Um, uh, you and Tad well, need to hook up for yeah. this. Tom, you've, you've come a long way since that first 2.5 day excursion yeah. on the long path, right? Yes. Yes, I have. Do you have any suggestions uh, for the listeners uh, besides, you know, donating to your local charities and stuff? Suggestions? Uh, what about hikes or, I mean, anything, you know, any. Well, first of all, the one thing I would say about it certainly is trail maintainers. Um, who's ever listening, if you're a hiker and you do hike the trails, please, you know, get in touch with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference or even your local hiking club, uh, um, Edgewater hikers, whatever, and see about picking up a little piece of trail. The, it, it's nice. I mean, I call it my trail. You know what I mean? I said, I'm going out to work on my trail. Um, you take ownership of it and you just, just take care of a little piece. And it's, it's not that difficult. And if more people got involved with that, it would make it a lot nicer for everybody, you know? Um, so th that's, you know, as far as that goes, I could say that, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it, it's what it's all about. Everybody volunteers. You know, I, I forgot how I said this, Ted, but anybody in volunteers 16 hours of your 365 days a year you know 16 hours of your life that could make a difference within any trail within the, you know the united states oh and yeah i mean i know probably like five or six people listen to this podcast so it's it's not going to maybe make a difference but you know what five or six people can make a difference you know well i told some people this week so we might have might have about a dozen so uh, well hey that's a freaking increase that i said <laughs> no, I, I made sure i told some people so we uh, hopefully we got a few more this week so. well hopefully andy will get a hold of me i've been trying to get a hold of him for years about this steven oh, got a hold I'll of hook you up with him no problem no problem please I'll, I'll, make sure, I'll make sure he gets in touch with you i mean he, he doesn't he's know you want to talk to i'm telling you what he you want to talk to somebody about the long path he's the guy well he's probably got the stories like you do probably Oh, he's, he's got the stories. All right. And he knows a lot about the history. Um, as you talk with Steve a couple of weeks ago, how it was originally points of interests back in the thirties or forties, whatever it was, where it was just a bunch of spots across the state. And it was up to you to find out how to get there. And then, <laughs> and then people started making trails to them. And there was, I mean, it, it only went up to Wyndham until maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago. It was when it started going north of Wyndham. So, I mean, um, and Andy's been involved in it. Like I said, he's got a steel trap for this stuff, too. He knows yeah. everything about this long path. So, um, I've, I've talked to Stephen. Hook me up. You and Stephen get together. Hook me up with him because I have been reaching out to him for years. So. All right. Well, yeah. No, I'll make sure of it in the next. He's on vacation right now, but he'll get back to you when he gets back. Okay. Okay. So, last question of the night, Tom post hike bruise and bites uh you know it doesn't have to be the cat skills i kind of prefer the cat skills but what do you suggest to get while doing the long path what was your favorite stop that just well obviously brios um you know, oh um, yeah yeah i mean that that's that's a no-brainer if you're going to phoenicia you got to go to brios and for me one of my favorites always is um is outpost barbecue outpost barbecue nice yes. all right yeah. Route 209, just outside Warwasing. When you come down from uh, Section 15, you come down from Vernoy Falls into 209. I believe it would be to the left from there. But um, actually, my first time through, when the northbound, Andy picked me up because he was I was taking a zero day. And on the way to the hotel, we stopped there. And it was like 5 to 8. They were closing at 8 o'clock. And I ordered all this food. And um, 
I said to the woman after she took my money, I was waiting. I said, I'm so glad you're still open. And she says, why? What's going on? And I says, I just got done walking 15 miles today, carrying all this weight. And what's going on? I told her my hiking for charity. And she says, hey, Bobby, come here. She calls Billy or whoever he is. She says, tell him. So I told him and he was like, turns to her and he says, feed this man. And <laughs> she opened the register and handed me back all my money and gave me a big mm. bag of food and sent me on my way. And I've been back four times since then. You know, um, wow. the guy, he stepped to the plate. He fed me a good meal and I'll never forget it. And I, I actually brought Andy there for dinner on this hike. Andy met me. Um. He brought me to the hotel in Ellenville. So before we went, we went to our post for, for some dinner this time too. It's definitely good, good food. Yeah. I got to admit uh, the long path, the Catskills, the camaraderie is just out of control. It's beautiful. Uh, I, I've never experienced, you know, I, I've been to other places and, and just the kindness and stuff in the Catskills and outside of the Catskills just blows my mind all the time. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It really is. Yeah, and uh, I'm just I'm very happy, and that's why you know uh, a big reason why I do this podcast is that we are all stuck together and we can all make a big difference in this place, and uh, we do, we actually do. You know, with coming up once again with the sponsors, with the the people who support the podcast, with people like you, Tom, who raise money for this, it just it blows my freaking mind that we can do this in this such a small area. Uh, and I see places, other, you know, bigger areas that struggle in, in this, in this sense of mind, let's say the, of, of volunteerism and raising charity and stuff. So thank you, Tom. My for pleasure. Number, yeah. Thank you for, for joining us and thank you for number, number, number one, for doing all this charity for your local trails and for your local organizations. I really appreciate yeah. it. Tom, you're well, like the like 25, $25,000 man. Yeah, well, and, like and I said, I, I enjoy it. Um, it. It's fun for me, and it gets me to meeting people and and like you guys and doing things like this, and and uh, I, I love it. So I thank you guys for allowing me to come on your show and and promote these both these charities that I raise money for, and yeah. promote the warm path too. Yeah, and also thank your daughter for hooking us up with this. <laughs> yes, I will. I could otherwise I would have been holding my phone this whole time trying to figure oh, this out. So. <laughs> God, I've 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 been on with people like that, and they've like tried to place it up against places, and I've seen their forehead the whole time. So <laughs> I'm glad. Thank your daughter for this. I appreciate it, and sorry, you know that it took almost two and a half hours for this, but it was a fantastic chat. Yeah, um, it went quick. I, I appreciate that. I I love it, Tom. I hope to see you out. You know, what's sad is we're right next to each other, but we haven't seen each other out on the trail. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Let's I'm go to Bramley that. Mountain, maybe, maybe right? I was just going to say Bramley Mountain. I did that today, so we, we didn't talk about that today. But once okay. again, I'd like to thank the monthly supporters and the monthly sponsors. Really appreciate you guys contributing to the show. Uh, thank you to everybody who has donated to Hard Ciders. Thank you to everyone who is still listening. 135 episodes in. Uh, Tad joined me again tonight. Thank you, Tad, for joining me. Tom, thank you once again for joining me. This was an awesome chat. Congratulations on your your north to south, your south to north finish. But once again, the only person who has done it so far. Keep kicking ass. I will. All right. Have a good night. Uh, see you guys soon. All Thanks, right, Tom. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Thanks, Todd. Thanks, guys. Hey everyone, I just want to thank you for listening to the show. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe and throw down a smooth review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any podcast platform that you use. You can also check daily updates of the podcast, hikes, hiking news, and local news on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the official website of the show. Remember this... You gotta just keep on living in the cat skills, man. L I V I N. Wicked, 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 wicked.